What's up, everybody? It's your boy DJ C Creature Sex, y'all, and welcome to another episode of Real Me and Colon, a movie podcast. On this week's episode, Joel and I will take a look at the world of. Well, not exactly. We're not doing uh, movie news or movie trailers this week. We're going to jump straight into the meat, which is reviewing Star Wars, The Last Jedi, and The Shape of Water. And then Joel will have two mini reviews to follow. So what are we going to think about all these movies and, you know, just everything? Star Wars is super divisive right now. Well, what's going to happen? So you're going to have to sit down, relax, and find out. What's up, what's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Real Me and Colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for it, but hey, we're going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and well, anything about movies. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chase Lee, and hey guys, listen, if you were searching on the internet to find another uh, article bashing Star Wars The Last Jedi, I- I'm sorry to inform you that you, uh, you've you been misdirected towards a movie podcast, but that's okay. If you're not a movie podcast uh, fan or even a fan of movies, well, hopefully we can convince you to be one. That's the whole point here. We are fans of movies. You guys are fans of movies. Let- let's talk about some, shall we? But anyways, this is episode 210. Uh, and we are recording this on a Friday night, and you're getting it on a Friday night because Happy Holidays, Merry Christmas, and whatever you celebrate, you get an early gift from us. That's because because we love you. That's just the simple truth. Because we love your asses, we thank you for listening every single week. So you get an early podcast episode. But this is episode 210, and what we typically do is we do movie news and trailers that drop throughout the week, and yes, there were a lot that dropped, we are well aware of that, but um, we decided to skip it this week and just jump straight to the good stuff, Uh, you know, so you guys don't have to sift around uh, and wait for the reviews, we'll jump straight to it. Uh, Os- or Joel will have his uh, uh, his Oscar segment like he normally does, and then we will jump into uh, one of the most anticipated movies of the year, and... Uh, Another one. Uh, so uh, the most uh, anticipated divisive one is Star Wars The Last Jedi. We'll, we will break that down uh, as detailed as we can without you know, spoiling uh, you know, too much. We might do some minor stuff, but like it's not going to be like anything major. Uh, and then we're going to be reviewing The Shape of Water, the new uh, Guillermo del Toro uh, film. And then, of course, Joel will have a couple of mini reviews. So, and then we'll discuss some box office stuff from last week, but that's about it. But yeah, uh, so before we get in the episode and I introduce the the wonderful co-host over there, please uh, like this, share it around, and let people know this is the Definitive Movie Podcast, and this is where you get your shit from, everyone. So, without any further ado, uh, the the wonderful co-host over there, and this is probably, um, you know, besides a Harry Potter movie that we're reviewing, this anytime we're going to be doing any Star Wars anything, it's going to be one of his most anticipated episodes to cover. So, Joel, how are we doing over there? Have you had a heart attack just yet? And we, we haven't even talked about Star Wars yet. <laughs> I'm dead over here, man. It's just my corpse. It's my corpse. Uh, how are you all doing? I'm, I'm a zombie. No, um, I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, obviously, Star Wars is one of my nerd passions. I, I love the series. Um, I know that you're you know, sort of a casual fan. I'm, I'm a hardcore fan. I love the series. I spent all of the previous week... Um, uh, leading up to the Last Jedi, re- revisiting the series and uh, just loving it all over again, you know, except for parts of the Phantom uh, Menace, but I'll get to that later. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super excited. I'm always uh, there's always a lot to discuss with the Star Wars movie, even if you don't like it. There's there's just a lot to discuss because it's an event. Uh, people respond very strongly to it, as we've seen <laughs> uh, certainly, and I will have a word about those reactions, by the way. Um, uh, I, I, I will, too. Regardless yeah. of my thoughts on the movie, I, I have something to say <laughs> about these whiny-ass bitches. But anyways, uh, <laughs> continue, Joel. Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably after the review, we'll, we'll, we'll address all of that um, rather than before it. But uh, And certainly the spoiler thing before our review, or before my part of the review, I will lay out what spoilers are for everybody because they are not what most people think they are. Um, and we'll lay out, you know, what a film critic's job is, you know, regardless of what, uh, we think of ourselves, we are critical in nature. And so that makes us film critics in some way. And, you know, part of our job is, is, uh, is going to be explained here in a bit, uh, with regard to spoilers. 
and what constitutes spoilers. So we'll we'll uh, we'll certainly talk a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm super excited to get into it. Uh, but first, of course, I have to do the big Oscar stuff this week. Um, and you know what? Well, Joel, Joel gonna... let, let's let, let's slow down a little bit. Let, let's tease our wonderful listeners. Like you know. <laughs> How has your week been going? Like, oh, what are you yeah, up yeah, to this sure. holiday season? Like, you're just jumping into this shit, Only, and you're just like, well, we'll fuck everything. Let's just jump right into it. Only movies matter, Chase. No. Um, okay. So <laughs> it's been an interesting week. We've we've had a lot of, you know, we're entering um, uh, Christmas season at work, so we've had a lot of theft-related stuff happen this week. It's been very interesting. Well, that, I, it's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't really talk about there's there's a couple of them I can't talk about because they involve uh, we had to involve the police so it becomes a legal thing but I will say though like this is my first Christmas with movie trading company and or with vintage stock in general uh, which is the parent company and I've seen kind of like a, a glimpse of how they handle it um, and it's with a lot of stress and sarcasm and that totally fits my uh, personality so it's been a very interesting week so far uh and it's only going to get a little more intense tomorrow um I, ha- I i work tomorrow and you know it's a couple days before christmas so we're probably going to get a ton of people and uh luckily i don't work on christmas eve we're only open six hours but i don't work that day so i'm, I'm sort of happy um but nevertheless it's it's getting, it's getting there. Uh, it's so, getting. Into- so, what are you, what are you up to uh, for for Christmas? Where you are you staying at your parents' house? What, what are you doing? Uh, we're having a little family gathering, just the uh, media family. Uh, nobody's really going anywhere. Um, I think next year is going to be the big year where where out of town stuff happens. But this year, just kind of a quiet thing. Um, my brothers and sisters in law and their kids. Um, I've six uh six five five nephews and a niece and then another niece on the way that was something that we found out this week by the way um we have a niece we have a niece coming in may i think it is or march or i I can't remember anyway um but yeah so that it's just kind of a sunday morning thing and and then i think i'm seeing all the money in the world with my parents uh that evening so on uh, christmas eve evening uh, but Christmas Day is just going to be a day of relaxation and watching Christmas movies, probably. So um, that's about it. Just kind of staying at home. All right. Yeah. I'm same here. Uh, just going to my parents' house and you know just staying there, I guess. <laughs> uh, but, you, know, I, you know, throughout the week, I've just been kind of just been kind of kicking it because I went to you know California last weekend and it just it, it was you know just draining traveling, but it was a lot of fun though. But um, uh, yeah, I saw Star Wars for the first time in California. Uh, and then I also saw it a second time this past week, and uh, it's you know it's, it's been very Star Wars heavy. And like, what's really interesting about Star Wars is, yes, Joel is right. I'm you know just a casual fan, but what I really appreciate, uh, especially like after the Force Awakens and Rogue One, I will watch the movies, um, and then I'll you know read reviews, watch reviews, and just see like everyone's perspective on it. And even with the you know the backlash, well, the stupid backlash, but like all the controversy, I guess. I uh, just I just love reading all that stuff because I'm just like I can't believe people are this passionate. Like it's 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 crazy. But I mean, yeah, it's been a fun week. Uh, so um, yeah, so uh, you know, uh, we hope everyone out there listening has a great uh, holiday season and. Uh, yeah, so that that's kind of yeah, our what, whatever you observe on Monday, if it happens Monday, then we hope you have a great one and uh, a great weekend leading up to that. Exactly. And, and you know, Joel, we're, we're getting towards the end of the year, so you know, Oscar nominations are just around the corner. So, what do you got this week on your Oscar segment? Yeah, so we're entering the big contenders here. Uh so I'm going to start out with supporting actress uh because this is this was for a while, a pretty kind of fluid um, category. It, it didn't really have a lot of clear-cut nominees uh, as contenders or contenders, um, but it's kind of taking shape, and it's still taking shape. Uh, of course, all of these take shape, but this one's still taking shape in a big way because it feels like a lot of performances are being uh, pinpointed as you know major contenders in a way. That's really exciting, especially as the critics start, you know, having their say. So a couple of performances that you wouldn't expect have kind of risen up 
to you know near the top and are likely to be nominated. Um, the two that I feel are like right outside the nominees and could uh, slip in are Mary J. Blige, who has this really meaty role in Mudbound. Uh, this is her first movie, actually, which is surprising to learn. Uh, you'd think that Mary J. Blige, you know, she's really popular R&B artist, that she would have a movie. I think she had a bit role in something at one point, but this is her first major, like, actual role, and it's a really good performance from her. Uh, and also, Tiffany Haddish in Girls Trip. I have not seen Girls Trip, but I've heard that her performance is really, really funny in it, and it could be sort of the Melissa McCarthy uh, nomination this year. I've, I've heard that she's really terrific. She um, uh, she could very well get in, but I feel like the performance that has bubbled up uh, in in consideration here is one that I'm going to be talking about in depth later on in the episode, and that's Hong Chow in Downsizing. Uh, it's an amazing performance, and uh, it's a it's a you know I'll, I'll I'll tell you later on whether the movie is good or not. But well, th- thanks for your uh, slight stutter there. That tells me that <laughs> it kind of wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, no, no. Well, maybe. I don't know. All right. So the performance is amazing, though, and it's a really special kind of role for somebody to play. Uh, she takes it and runs with it. It's a very unique movie, uh, and it's a very good role for her. So I, I feel like this is this is a chance for her to, to kind of pop in there out of nowhere, really, because, you know, previously I think that she was in um, – inherent vice like in a brief role but other than that i can't really think of anything she was in and so this is the this is the big star making role so i feel like she might be like you know one of of these three performances that have been uh pinpointed as you know major contenders that weren't weeks ago i feel like she's the one that's kind of going to be nominated but the other four are fairly clear cut i think octavia spencer in the shape of water is a performance that they will really admire um, especially considering they like Octavia Spencer a lot. Uh, she's won already. I think she was nominated again a couple years after that. Um, and so it's, it's a, uh, it's a performance. It's a really good performance. It's not a big performance, but it's, it's a good one. And, uh, I think that they'll really respond to it. Um, but the top three are most certainly Holly Hunter in the big sick, um, Allison Janney in I, Tanya and Laurie Metcalf in Lady Bird, uh, which are the three performances from actresses uh, who are playing mothers. Uh, this year has been a, a big one about, you know, movies w- that make you want to call your mother. Um, and those are kind of the three where Allison Janney is sort of the, the acerbic one. I haven't seen the movie, but I know that's kind of the nature of the performance uh, is sort of the acerbic, sarcastic one. Um, and then, you know, Laurie Metcalf and Holly Hunter have performances that kind of go for the heartstrings and really work. Um, and I feel like the winner here is going to be Laurie Metcalf, Laurie Metcalf, but it could be any of those three, to be honest. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so, yeah. So, once again, I feel like the nominees are going to be Hong Chow for Downsizing, Holly Hunter for The Big Sick, Allison Janney for I, Tanya, Laurie Metcalf for Lady Bird with The Win. And then Octavia Spencer for The Shape of Water. Uh, but it's going to be very interesting to see how these final few weeks shape up because it could be that, you know, <laughs> Tiffany Haddish gets in or Mary J. Blige or even Catherine Keener for Get Out uh, is a performance that, are, that people are talking about. Uh, Leslie Manville and Phantom Thread, you know. So these are like performances that are that are waiting in the wings for people to see them and, and appreciate them. So uh, we will see on that. Supporting actor – is next uh this one's kind of been you know going back and forth between a few actors on the on the uh outskirts so it feels incredibly weird to say this but i feel like a performance that is right there like on the outside about to get in and i'm not kidding here is christopher Plummer and all the money in the world and it's uh partly because of the story of the movie which, you know, to remind everybody, uh, anybody who didn't know and was living under a rock the last few weeks, uh, he replaced Kevin Spacey in the last six weeks in the movie. Um, and apparently the performance is still, like, incredible. They they were able to get a major, uh, you know, Oscar-worthy performance out of him uh, somehow. 
And uh, so I feel like that's right on the outside alongside um, Michael Stuhlbarg in Call Me By Your Name. He has this great scene at the end of the movie um, that I'll get uh, I'll intimate about later on that could very well be his Oscar clip. Um, but a, a pair of performances in Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri – could very well be vying for each other, which means that they'll probably cancel each other out. But Sam Rockwell uh, and Woody Harrelson are the two big ones this this uh, this season from that movie. Uh, they're both amazing, and uh, I feel like they're they're definitely going to be kind of going up against each other, which could spell something of a disaster for Rockwell, who I think gives the best perform one of the best performances of the year in the movie. He's he's in my top five. Um, performances in general this year um and then also army hammer in call me by your name uh is has kind of taken over stolbarg's earlier in the season buzz to really uh surprise and wow people um voters i'm hearing love him the oscar um the academy uh screening went really well uh particularly for him they got he got a standing ovation i heard so uh, that could spell a lot of success for him. Um, also, really good performance that I think is the best in the movie. And it's kind of hard to talk about some of this stuff because I'm reviewing two of these movies uh, later on in the show. But uh, Richard Jenkins in, in The Shape of Water is a terrific performance, kind of the heart of the movie, um, I think. And that one is is surprising a lot of people. Uh, it's kind of taken over the the buzz talk from Michael Shannon in that in that way um and then willem dafoe is pretty much the clear front runner right now for the florida project it's it's a movie that people love it's a performance that people really connect to it's deep it's deeply heartfelt it's a terrific performance and uh certainly one of the better the better performances this year um and so i feel like that's probably the winner uh so once more i think that the nominees are going to be willem dafoe and the florida project for the win uh, Army Hammer in uh, Call Me By Your Name, Richard Jenkins in The Shape of Water, Woody Harrelson in Three, Bill- Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, and Sep- Sam Rockwell for Three, Bo- blah, 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 Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. So uh, those, those I think, are going to be no- the nominees. But I'm telling you, like, there's some stuff waiting out there, uh, just, you know, waiting for people to see them and vote for them and get unexpectedly kind of nudged in there like Christopher Plummer, Michael Stuhlbarg, Mark Rylance for Dunkirk uh, is a performance that's kind of small, but it's a centerpiece. Uh, Again, Michael Shannon, you know, Jason Mitchell in Mudbound is really good. So I feel like these are, these are performances. Oh, Bob Odenkirk in the post, a really meaty role in a, in a great ensemble. So I feel like, I feel like uh, these, these are two really interesting races, not as, Interesting as actor and actress, and I'll get into those uh, on the episode that we're recording on January seventh. Uh, that's the next time that I'll be I'll be back with with some of these uh, predictions. Uh, so that's where they're both standing right now. Yeah, I mean that that sounds all correct to me, and you're extremely right about Willem Dafoe. He's such a likable character that we can get behind. I mean, there's one scene in the movie where he shoes away a pasty Roy Moore. It's it's spectacular. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I was I was thinking in my head like how I was going to word that, and uh, it, my <laughs> delivery was terrible, but I'm getting better. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty creepy scene, but uh, it's definitely like a, a Casper uh, Roy Moore. All right, so uh, yeah, I uh, I agree with uh, all of those picks. There's a couple of uh, movies I haven't seen, and since I haven't reviewed it for you guys. Um, and I'm not going to maybe review it uh, for uh, a future episode. But I will say that I agree with uh, Sam Rock, uh, Rockwell's performance in um, uh, Three Billboards. It's quite possibly my favorite character and character arc I've seen all year in th- like movies, like period. It- it's such a well-rounded role, and you, you f- feel like... You know, you hate this guy. He's just a despicable dumbass. And then, like, as the movie progresses, he becomes this guy that you understand. And it's like, 
oh, he's got a lot of hatred inside. And, you know, there was one person that could, like, change him around. And, you know, it was such a, a natural progression and didn't feel forced. It just, it was so wonderful. And he was the supporting character. It's crazy. But I totally agree. <laughs> uh, definitely one of my favorites. Uh, as far yeah. as... It's easy how easily somebody could have just played the caricature of that role. Exactly, because when, when he there starts is a out, caricature, there is a caricature of that role that exists. Um, absolutely. When, when he when he starts out in the movie, he's almost like a caricature, and then yeah. as it progresses, he becomes more real and grounded. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a it's a fascinating um, journey to take, and uh, with that with that character in particular, he the way he turns around from being this you know violent racist. Uh, cop to being potentially the most sympathetic presence um, considering the question that he asks someone at the end at the very last shot of the movie mm-hmm. um, you know he could very well be the most sympathetic presence here which in which case you know it's 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 great and uh, all the pushback against that role recently is nonsense there there have been people who who are like you know but he's a racist cop. He doesn't deserve a redemption arc. And if that's a redemption arc, I, I don't I don't think I know what a redemption arc is. That that doesn't that doesn't seem like a redemption arc to me. But in any case, um, certainly a complex arc. But yeah. a redemption arc a redemption arc is a different thing. Uh, and I, I don't because think... the the thing is like yes, you feel for that character, but at the same time, you can still hate him on the yeah, drop of a he's, dime. He's made his bed, whatever yeah. it is. He's made his bed. He's he he's past the point of any genuine forgiveness on mm-hmm. the point of on the on the on the part of the audience. But he's trying to excuse me. He's trying to uh, make things better for himself on his own terms. Correct. And they don't have to make sense sense to us. That that's not the job of a movie. The job of a movie is not to have every single little thing make sense to us. It makes sense to the characters, and that's that's enough. It, it, it's, and, it spoke volumes when he actually did shift his tone because you knew deep down that, like, th- this is probably not, like, some racist D-bag. And so when you get to the heart of the matter, you're like, yeah, I understand, like, why he, the, why he is the way he is. And, you know, there's a certain point in the movie where you feel bad for him. You want him to escape a certain yeah. scenario and you're like dude please you gotta go so uh yeah, yeah no i i absolutely love that movie by the way i saw that the same night i saw shape of water uh which is a great segue we'll get into that in just a second but guys we gotta start out with star wars th- th- this is it They're like th- this is the the movie that joel just salivates over um <laughs> it's i mean th- this is you know a, a fact and so um I will go ahead and start this off, and of course, Joel will describe it, but I, I'm not going to even tell you what I thought about the movie, but I will tell you that my experience with the franchise has been this. Um, my first one I ever saw was Phantom Menace. It was. I, I never watched the original trilogy as a kid, and if I did, I don't remember it. Um, it's not because I didn't want to. It's just, you know, I you know, I didn't get around to it, um, and so... Yeah, I, I start with the Phantom Menace, and of course, you know, they're goofy little kids' films. I've always equated this whole franchise into a kids' franchise. Like, they're kids' films, which is fine. And then you have maybe one installment here and there where it kind of advances, you know, themes and, you know, character growth to where it could actually, like, apply to, um, you know, some adult matter. And, you know, I, I appreciate that. But Phantom Menace is purely a kids' film. So is Attack of the Clones. Revenge of the Sith is more. It's more adult. Uh, it's more media. It's one of Joel's favorites, um, as he has told me. I'm I'm whatever to it. Uh, when I finally got around to watching A New Hope, it's fine. Uh, it's it's a nice little piece of entertainment. Empire Strikes Back is is pretty good. You know, it's uh, I actually like darker themed movies because like, I'm a depressing individual. Um, and then Return of the Jedi, once again, it's kid friendly. It's it's fine. Um, and then of course. Uh, you know, The Force Awakens, I told Joel, and I reviewed on, you know, this podcast. I like it. <laughs> Once again, it's it's entertaining. I, you know, it's great, got great special effects, and I like the new new characters, and, um, uh, you know, the action was nice. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm very, I'm just very lukewarm with this franchise where it's like, yeah, that was, that was cool. Um, and then, of course, Rogue One, I didn't really care for. I don't. I, I don't give a shit what you tell me and say, oh, well, you know, what what they were doing was uh, 
a, a suicide mission, it's like, yeah, no shit, but if I still don't care about them, then I don't care about their suicide mission. Um, other than the special effects, I didn't really care for Rogue One. So now we're here. We get to episode eight. And so you figure at this point, someone like me would kind of give up. Where it's like, at this point, am I really going to be changed? Like, am I going to see a new Star Wars film and think differently than I ever have before? Well, I'll get into that in just a second. Joel, what (laughs) is Star Wars The Last Jedi about? (laughs) Well, first, I guess I'll give my own uh, history with the franchise. Um, So, without mincing words, Star Wars is the reason that I like movies, and I mean that literally because uh, it's uh, A New Hope is the first movie I remember watching in full and have the full memory of watching it. Uh, I was four or five. It, It was somewhere between those ages. And, um, you know, uh, my parents were pretty big fans of the franchise, uh, not as big as I would become, but they, they liked it a lot. Uh, they've seen all the movies and theaters. So, um, interestingly enough, uh, I know that you watched the, so you watched all three of the prequels first, right? Yeah. Okay. So you kind of came into it knowing that Anakin becomes Darth Vader. Yes. Okay, so I came into it knowing not that. (laughs) So, I mean, this is the thing. Like, the first twist in a movie that you see as a child, unless you're Chase, I guess, is um, the fact that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. And so, which is a known fact. I'm not going to say spoiler warning. Um, every, for a movie that came out in 1980, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. It's 37 years old. Um, so my parents, you know, showed me the the movie. I didn't know, of course, at the age of four or five, uh, which this would have been 1993 or four, that you know I didn't know that truth. So I I went into the Empire Strikes Back completely cold of any spoilers because they wanted it to be that way. You know, they knew that it was a bit a, a big um, a big spoiler, so it completely like threw me for a loop. Uh, it, it's a moment that still holds power now, knowing the secret, just because of the fact that it comes out of left field so much. It it redefines what you think about the movie, uh, the Empire or the series uh, up until that point, um, not coming at it, you know, with the knowledge from the prequels. Um, and so New Hope and Empire Strikes Back are both really formative movies for me. I love both of them. I still love both of them. Uh, they're both A-plus movies, if you will. Um, and Return of the Jedi is really good. I don't hold it in such high esteem. I think that it spends a little too long on indoor with the Ewoks. Uh, I like the Ewoks. I think that they're kind of interesting, cute, like cute slash vicious creatures, which I think is an interesting um contradiction I, I i've always found that interesting it just spends too much time with them it's the longest of the three and it feels the longest of the of the three but it's still really good it's got the best climax of the series with uh luke the emperor and vader and all that i think it's i think it's great so i'm i'm a huge fan of the original trilogy the so-called original trilogy uh the prequels I'm going to just go out and say it. I think that they're fine i'm not a prequel hater i think the pe- the people who hate the prequels are generally speaking not actually fans they are what i call fanboys and i would like to pause for a second and define to you what i think a fanboy is now here's here's the thing i'm if you consider if you listener consider yourself a fanboy of something and you don't consider yourself to do this what i'm about to describe then i think that you're actually just a fan because i think that fanboys hate the thing they love that's that's what I think they they feel their job is. So, and the reason is because it feels like there's there's never any way that you can be completely satisfied. And and how that you know kind of comes to me is uh, the response to the Last Jedi, which getting into this briefly right now, is essentially the Force Awakens did too much that was similar to the original trilogy, and the Last Jedi does too much that's different. So what do you want? I don't understand. What makes Star Wars Star Wars for you? Is it one thing or is it the other? Because you can't have 
some weird middle ground where nothing exists. Um, and I'll get into that in more depth later on when we talk about the, uh, the response to this movie. So I don't hate the prequels. I think that the Phantom Menace is like the definition of a C plus movie. I'm, I, I think it's, uh, firmly okay. Uh, it has a great finale. It's just got this sluggish, uh, slow middle that kind of goes nowhere. Jar Jar is fine in theory as a comic relief character, but he doesn't fit into what they're trying to do with the movie. Um, so I don't, I don't completely hate him, but I don't like how he fits in the movie. Um, Attack of the Clones has problems, specifically with the uh, the romance elements that are really wooden and um, and kind of poorly performed. But for me, the Who Done It mystery involving Obi Wan trying to find out, you know, uh, where's where's the missing planet? Who are the, who are the clone troops? You know, what's what's this with the um, the long dead Jedi Master, whatever. Anyway, I'm getting into super nerd stuff there. Uh, I think all of that is fascinating, and I and I love watching it uh, take shape. And the the serious uh, approach to the mythology is always appreciated. So I like it. I I kind of like it. Basically, it's kind of a B minus, I guess. Um, and then uh, oh, and a probably a B plus for Return of the Jedi. I'm just going through my grades here. Um, <clears throat> Revenge of the Sith. I love it. pretty much everything except for the line of dialogue from my point of view, the Jedi are evil, which is really awkward. Other than that, everything about that movie works for me. It's a bold blockbuster, um, and it, it pretty much confirms like the turning point from, you know, as Chase was saying, mostly a kid's series to something that will appeal to adults as well. Uh, and so I'd give that one an A. It's, it's one of my favorites. Um, so then, you know, you fast forward to 2015, Force Awakens, I thought was a lot of fun. Uh, it does sort of crib a little bit from the formula of A New Hope, but not as much as people like to say. I, I, there, are, there are massive differences um, that, you know, I've, I've seen A New Hope dozens of times, and I, and I know the, the movie back to front. There are differences. Um, but it's a lot of fun, and it, it introduces the new characters really well. I think I'd give that one a B plus, probably A minus, uh, probably an A minus actually. So, uh, Rogue One, I'm actually higher and higher on every time I view it. That's an A minus movie for me. I, I really like that it doesn't feel like Star Wars um, because it's doing something different. Um, and I do care about the Rebels plan. I mean, I, of course, I know what happens at the end of it because it's a, it's a foregone conclusion. But it's just it's just a really involving uh, heist thriller kind of. And it's set in the Star Wars universe, and I appreciated that. Um, and the visual effects, like Chase said, great. Um, and so that's sort of my history with the franchise leading up to this one. And of course, you know, needless to say, I was excited for it. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Chase to give his initial thoughts uh, on the movie. Yes. So, uh, and I forgot to mention, uh, Force Awakens, uh, I, I, I give it like a solid B, you know, I'm just fine. It was entertaining. Um, all right. So I've seen this movie twice and I can tell you, Joel and everyone out there listening that me as a, as a casual Star Wars fan, I just I take the movies as is, and I enjoy them. With Star Wars: The Last Jedi, after seeing it twice, I can tell you right now, it is my favorite in the franchise. I love it, and I love it because it's so weird and different than everything else, and I think that's why it worked for me. So uh, I'm going to be pretty high on it. Now, I do have problems with it, and it's actually probably most of everyone's problems with the movie. Um, but for me, two times now, I've seen it, I've, I've digested it, and I've come to the conclusion that it is my favorite one in the franchise, and it took eight movies to do it. So, uh, Joel, uh, initial thoughts for you. And are you, are you quite shocked over there? Like you, you, I didn't hear you breathe. I didn't hear you like <laughs> smirk or make a noise. Like, are you alive? I had, over there? I had a, a sudden heart attack again. I've had like six or something since we started. Um, <laughs> no, but I am, I, I, I am pleasantly surprised. Uh, it's not, it's not my favorite, um, for sure. But, uh, in fact, I think I actually 
to be completely honest, to not bury the lead, I like The Force Awakens a little bit more. Uh, as an experience and as, as something that, that unfolds as a plot, I think it I think it works a little better than this one. But this one's really good. I, I'm, I'm a very big fan. Um, it's strong Star Wars. Uh, it's maybe not like capital G great Star Wars, but it is strong Star Wars. Uh, I do have a few problems with it, though. And I've only seen it once, actually. This is ironic that Chase, a casual fan, has seen it more times than me. It's just because I haven't had time. I've, I've been watching so many other movies trying to catch up. Um, but I, I think I might plan to go out and see it again on Christmas Day um, because that would be a lot of fun. So anyway, um, but yeah, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a very big fan of this. Yeah, uh, so it, I'll, I'll let you kind of dig in uh, a little more and start us off. Yeah. It's, so, I mean, do you want to start with negatives first and reverse yeah, it? Yeah, okay. let's start with negatives. And in fact, actually, uh, I guess we'll just like air this live. Uh, I, I feel like the new rule should be if there's something that's clearly highly positive, uh, <laughs> we, we start with the negatives because it's just like <laughs> we would be building up to these last few things and it's kind of a lame cliffhanger. Um, exactly. If we do negatives last, you know, or you might as well get them out of the way. So give your negatives um, first. Okay, so with Star Wars, I mean, this is kind of why we didn't want to do movie news and movie trailers this week is because. Joel's right. We have to break this down. I'm talking like by character. Uh, so it, this is oh. gonna get like. Hey what? Chase. So yeah. first, I forgot that I that I talked earlier about how we're gonna deal with spoilers. So I want to get into that right now. Uh, before we before we start our reviews and like. Okay, in now I hate the movie. Now you just interrupted me. <laughs> we're, we're... You, you just went for it. And now I fucking hate the movie. Like. <laughs> All right, so here's this is this is just a little thing for the audience, um, and I just want to tell everybody when I say this, I, I'm not meaning to be condescending. I certainly won't have any wording that's that's intended to be condescending, um, but I will just say, you know, as a film critic, it's not a film critic's job to appease every viewer's wish to know exactly what they want to know. Uh, so spoiler. Spoilers require context to be spoilers uh, in two ways. One, there's the empirical context, which is that you actually have to see it for the, for the experience to be spoiled. Being told something is not being spoiled on it because it could still take you by surprise in the movie. Two, you have to have surrounding context for this stuff to be spoiler. Uh, we certainly won't go into depth about anything really in the second or third acts, but anything I believe – that's up to like the 30 minute mark is up for grabs to mention in a review. So if you are, if you have somehow not seen this movie yet, um, and you are one of those people who believes that a spoiler is anything after like five seconds when it comes to star Wars, I would just maybe not listen to this episode right now. I would go see the movie, uh, you know, come back fresh, uh, and then listen to it. That's why we, that's sort of part of why we gave a week, uh, you know, a week break, not only for Chase, but, you know, uh, we kind of planned it that way uh, so that we weren't doing it just a few days after. It was almost a full week uh, or a full week by now. Um, but, yeah, so spoiler spoiler ish alert. <laughs> well, and, and Joel was kind of kidding. If you want to just skip ahead, like that's the cool thing about what I've yeah, recently yeah. been doing. I, mean, I got Chase... the times below in the description. If you want to jump to the shape of water, you can do that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that also, I, I, I totally forgot to mention that, but yeah, if you would just want to skip this review and then come back to it after you've seen it, that's, that's yeah, totally fine. It's totally up to cool. you. Uh, but we will not tiptoe around really anything in the first 30 minutes. Cause it's, you know, setting up the plot. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Um, so. so starting out with negatives, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just say it because this is kind of this is kind of the big stinker, if you will, amongst most of the critics that I, I've read or have seen. Um, and it has to involve a storyline with Finn and the new character Rose. Now I will say that the actors themselves, they're not the problem. I've always enjoyed Finn's kind of you know carefree attitude but also like he he knows how to buckle down when shit is real uh rose is a nice character uh and you know the actor portraying her is um kelly marie tran she does a really really great job i I have no problem with the actual performances uh or or the characters themselves 
The problem is this storyline, they go to this random planet uh, and they have to go search for someone. And I will, um, I won't say who it is, but I will also say that's another weak point in the movie um, is they go, they go to this random planet, right? And they have to go search for a person uh, to, you know, advance their plans on what they want to do. And so the whole time, every time they kept cutting back to this, it just felt like a giant stop on the movie where it was like, hey, we got all this exciting stuff going here with like Luke and Ray or Kylo and, and Snoke or whatever. And then we have to jump to this bullshit and you're like, okay, th- this isn't really fitting with me. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I'm going to say this right now before I go any further. I love this movie, not because of the story. The story's fine with me. It, it's basically like Mad Max to me, where it's just like a giant long chase scene with some really great character moments. Um, why I like this movie is because of the of a lot of great scenes, a lot of great performances, and a lot of great character growth and arcs that I really appreciated to where the story, being as simple as it is, didn't really bother me. It was... Um, it was serviceable, and when you have all those great scenes kind of piling on top of that, that doesn't really matter to me because everything. That's else actually is- how that's actually how Star Wars is to me too. It's interesting. Interestingly enough, I just I guess respond um, stronger to it than you yeah. overall. But that's certainly how it is because uh, the reason that The Empire Strikes Back is one of my favorite movies is because it's this string of excellent moments, uh, one after another, uh, making up this you know fairly simple plot line. But it's it's they, they elevate it. Yeah, they elevate the characters. The, they they develop the characters. Uh, by the way, we have our first argument regarding this movie. Um, and, oh, whoa, and, oh, whoa, oh, yeah. Well, well, you're gonna have to hold your fucking ass there. All right. So, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So, anyways, uh, I, I didn't really appreciate this storyline. I felt like it just kind of cut through the movie and really didn't have <clears throat> any purpose. Um, because I, I I understand why they did it. Let's get that right. It wasn't because I was confused and I was like, what, why are they doing this random plan? It's like, I get what they were doing, but I just, I felt like it was an unnecessary kind of B turn in the movie when, I don't know, you could have done something else locally <laughs> with what they were trying to do because what they were trying to do was search for a specific person uh, played by Benicio Del Toro, which by the way, I thought that character was also unnecessary. I didn't really care for his performance. He was extremely underused, and he had a stupid ass stutter. The the second time when I watched it, I was like, "Why is that stutter there?" It drove me nuts. So that whole thing just felt like it was pointless because when that whole sequence is done, and uh, Del Toro does what he needs to do, he just leaves, and I'm just like, "What? What was the point of introducing this wonderful actor?" into this franchise as, as that character. It made no sense. I don't like that storyline. And talking about the planet itself, visually, sure, it looks fine. Uh, the creatures look a little goofy. Um, it kind of gave off this very like goofy vibe. And I, I get that there's humor in this, and we'll get, get to that in just a second. But this just felt too kiddish to me. And it just, I, I don't know, it just, the tonal shift to me, it just, it felt a little off. Um, I also didn't really care for the whole, like, animal abuse thing, like, shoved in your face. Uh, when you watch the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm not saying, I, I'm not, like, for animal abuse, so don't twist my words, but I, I'm telling you that there's a there's a way to kind of introduce these, these themes without seeming like it hits you over the head, if that makes any sense. So that's c- kind of my main issue uh, with this movie, is that storyline. And to, t- uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to pile on top of that, I think the one thing that pissed me off even more in that that storyline with fo- uh, I, I don't know why I said foes Finn and Rose, <clears throat> um, well, that could be their celebrity couple name though. That that could be. <laughs> um, no, the, the the thing I hated the most, and it pissed me off so much even more the second time. <clears throat> Finn does something at the end that's pretty heroic. And I was actually accepting what he was doing. And I thought to myself, excuse me, I don't know what's wrong with my throat. Um, As a character, when you see him start off in The Force Awakens, what the fuck? Sorry. Do you have water? I do not. Uh, So this is what you're going to get. Um, No, uh, in The Force Awakens, he starts out as a stormtrooper. And so he was forced into this kind of like youth Hitler type of, you know, regime 
And then he learns the error of his ways, and he wants to kind of change himself. That's fine. <clears throat> so I thought at the end of The Last Jedi, with what he was doing, I was accepting it. And there's something that happens. Someone interferes with this. It completely deflates any type of arc I had going for Finn. Because I actually wanted him to do this heroic thing. But he, he got interrupted with a cheesy ass moment, by the way. I don't believe what you know what happened uh, after that interruption at all, by the way. Um, but I will just say it's a <clears throat> relationship. I, I didn't I didn't believe it once. It just it felt so cheesy and corny. I was like, listen, for a movie that's about uh, people with lightsabers hitting each other and Jedi lifting rocks, uh, this was just way too cheesy for me. I was just like, no, I'm good. So there's that. Uh, to kind of delve into the humor, like I mentioned earlier, I thought some of it worked, some of it did not. Um, some of it I thought kind of <clears throat> under... <clears throat> what the fuck? <clears throat> Excuse me! Fuck! Um, I, th- I thought there was a couple of them that kind of un- undercut the dramatic tension throughout the movie. Uh, uh, Joel knows which one I'm talking about with uh, <laughs> with good old Luke at the island. Um, I just, I, I, I thought that just kind of undercut it a little bit and you could have handled that differently by, I don't know, dropping it on the ground and walking away. Um, so yeah, there, uh, there's the humor, uh, aspects about that. Uh, I mentioned, uh, Del Toro's character kind of being unnecessary. I kind of felt that way with, with, uh, with Laura Dern's character. I know Joel's going to probably think differently on that, but I, I thought she was fine. Now I will say that her arc was probably my favorite sequence slash shot in the movie. But yeah. I just thought, in general, she was just kind of like, she was there. She gets, she gets the big hero moment, let's just say. <laughs> yeah, she she gets the best, like Joel said, hero moment, sound design moment, uh, shot. Yeah. It, it was wonderful. It, like, it takes your breath away. But her character in general, I just, it was whatever. Um, as far as, like, other apparent flaws... I guess to address some of the issues that other people have, I didn't mind the fact that um, all the, I guess, questions that were answered were the way they are. Uh, I actually kind of liked that they were different and they were unexpected. Uh, This movie does take a lot of risk. It's very unpredictable, which I guess is kind of the charm about the movie. Um, uh, What else have people been complaining? Oh, uh, people have been complaining about, you know, Snoke in the movie. I'm actually okay with all that. Uh, I, I didn't have a problem with any of that. I think it's you know one of the better scenes in the movie. But uh, I'm, I'm sidetracking myself. To get with the negatives, uh, I'm really trying to struggle here because that was kind of my main issue was the, the Finn and Rose excuse me, storyline. Um, oh, yeah, I will say that some of the, uh, some of the Jedi stuff, uh, I will not say who because that goes past the 30-minute mark uh, for Joel. Um, but there is a certain character... To where they get sucked out of something. It's a great scene, by the way. Oh, yeah. And then it cuts away. And the anticipation as you're an audience member is like, well, what's going to happen to this person? Then it cuts to said person. And they use some type of Jedi stuff. And that was cheesy as hell. Um, It was a little too far-fetched even for me. And I understand that the whole point of the Jedi and the force is that every single installment that we've had is that the force is being used differently, which is great. I I like the fact that this is kind of like an evolving power. And so when these people are, you know, exuberating these new kind of force methods, we're learning as an audience member as well. But I just thought that certain character, what like, it was almost like too unrealistic. And once again, we're talking about a thing that can lift rocks. So, uh, that was, Joel knows exactly what I'm talking about. So I don't have to, you know, feel like I'm spoiling anything, but like that was just way, it was way too much. Even on the second time, I just, I almost laughed. It just, it was a little, a uh, little much. And I think the last uh, remaining thing for me, as far as like real negatives is the end. I hated the actual, like last, like 30 to 45 seconds, whatever that sequence was. Um, I think they should have oh, ended I, it. I know, I know what it was, and I'll yeah. tell you offline. But yeah, I, I think it should have <laughs> ended where it looked like it ended, uh, and then um, you know, uh, do that uh, 
weirdo shrinking into the the credits but i just thought that ending tacked on little section just felt so forced and was almost like here's the future of these movies and it's like uh, okay can we calm the fuck down and do this movie first um so yeah i I think uh, honestly that's it for the negatives I, i will say this isn't really a negative but this is kind of a nitpick uh i think it's interesting but it is a nitpick there wasn't really that much hand to hand lightsaber combat um when you really think about it there's yeah there there's very little um there's there's very little of it for for a, for a Star Wars movie i think it has the least um probably th- i'm going to have to think back on that but i'm well i mean except for rogue one of of the of the proper episodes uh, i yeah. i'm pretty sure it has the least it is uh-huh. definitely the least cuz like you know as the movie kept going cuz it's almost two and a half hours long uh, once it got to an eventual uh, hand-on-hand combat, I was just like, oh, we haven't really seen anything up until this point. Which, like yeah. I said, is fine. They take This whole movie takes chances, and Ryan Johnson decided not to um, show that much and focus more on character uh, characters and their growths and you know just their overall emotional states, which I that's m- one of my highest points of the movie, and that's why uh, I'm going to rate it so high, but... Well, and I guess I guess, as I keep talking, um, this is why Joel's the professional and this is why I'm the amateur. As I keep talking, I keep thinking of this. There is one scene, and Joel knows which one I'm talking about. There is one scene on the island uh, <laughs> with Luke and Ray where we see Luke's day-to-day activities, and <laughs> there was one of them that was completely oh, weird and unnecessary. I, I loved it. I, 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 I didn't. It was so fucking weird. It was – well, yeah, but, I mean, yeah, it's a movie of, with a bunch of oddities. Uh, well, and I, I, just, I, 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 I laughed in a, in a, in a grossed-out way, and I love that about the scene. I, 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 I totally it, it, get – I totally get people's problem with it. Okay, though. okay, so let me rephrase it. I didn't mind the scene as much if they didn't do a close up, and maybe if it was more of a wider oh. shot, um, <laughs> that might have been like the the look of satisfaction or whatever was too much. Yeah, it, it's like yeah, yeah. just seeing the close up uh, of what Luke was doing. I was like, that looks really pornographic. I'm good. Uh, so, uh, okay, so I think for the most part, that's all the negatives for me. But just to reiterate, uh. I do not think this movie's story is like spectacular, but I think the moments that are within the story, carrying the story along, are so well done and made me care about the characters so much more than Force Awakens that I honestly don't have that many negatives with it. That's why uh, I'm, you know, trying to think of other stuff to to say. But I think for the most part, I hit everything. Unless Joel can, you know, I mean, Joel's gonna, you know, retaliate with a couple of things. But I'm wondering if Joel has. Um, some different negatives that he didn't really uh, appreciate. So, Joel, take I, it away. I, I do actually. Um, so I'm gonna push obviously the rose fin stuff aside. I uh, I like that, and I'll tell you why in the positives. Um, so I'm probably about to cause a bunch of controversy here. Uh, so listeners, just beware. If I get a bunch of hate comments, I guess I'm welcoming them. Um, so my first big negative is the fact that. Shockingly enough, I feel like uh, a lot of the stuff with Luke is a bit weak. Um, not with Mark Hamill. I'll get to Mark Hamill later on. Um, I, 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 I think he's good. But I think it's interesting that we have this, this weird dynamic between Rey and Kylo that I won't really get into. Uh, it, it involves telepathy of some sort, uh, let's just say, um, that all of the all of the um, events that push her into her like path in this movie are egged on by Kylo and Luke in some way, but more prominently by Kylo, and so I feel like. Uh, this was sort of even like way, way, way more so than Han Solo in, in Force Awakens felt like an excuse to include him uh, to me. And again, that's that's nothing to do. Well, first of all, it's nothing to do with his final appearance, which is amazing. I won't get into that at all because that's obvious, uh, a, a, an obvious spoiler. His final scenes in the movie, I should say. Um, but. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I feel like uh, Ryan Johnson kind of started with this idea that he would, you know, sort of kind of crib the idea of Luke being Yoda to raise Luke in the scene and then just kind of didn't really know where to take that. Uh, and then along the way, you know, made this this um, concept of Kylo and Ray enjoying this telepathic communication method, um, and then ultimately undercut the Luke stuff because all of the stuff that drives her to do what she does in this movie comes from Kylo, um, which is kind of a nerdy thing to to mention, but it is a it is important to the plot and. I'm really trying to like duck around stuff here, but um, you know, such is the way of Star Wars. Uh, but yeah, so I felt like that was a little less effective than it could have been. You know, we waited you know two years from his silent appearance in Force Awakens, and you know, we we get this crabby kind of sad Luke, and that's really appreciated. But I don't really think the movie know quite knows what to do with him until the end. Uh, so that was a bit that was a bit frustrating, and that's my really my one big negative. Um, the last scene that you were talking about, the final 45 seconds or so, um, I guess I can get what you're saying. I, I did feel like it was strange. It clearly, clearly whatever they are kind of tie into his trilogy <clears throat> that he's going to be, uh, spearheading. I think, um, I think that's, you know, where they're going with this. They're, they're teasing the future of the franchise, like you said. It was a little frustrating, felt a little marvel in that way, um, and I don't, I don't really like it when Marvel does that in the stingers, you know. I much prefer the, the silly stingers in Marvel movies that have nothing to do with anything. So I, it did feel a little Marvel-like um, in, that, in that last few seconds. Um, let me think. So the, some of the creatures were a little over the top. I like the ice, um, whatever, I think that they call them crystal critters. Oh, those those were cool. I, I like the, the, yeah. the design of those. Yeah, those were those were really neat. I mean, the movie doesn't really use them to any degree, but um, you know, except for as like a, I think a diversion at some point or something. So, other than that, I mean, uh, the porgs, uh, like these are the big things that are that are that are um, kind of making the waves. People love them. People feel about them the way they feel they felt about Ewoks. And I'm just gonna say it like. I don't have any opinion about the porgs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, they add absolutely nothing to the movie. There, there they is, don't. there is. I mean, there. Other than the fact that they are inhabitants, uh, we can we can reveal this. They're they're inhabitants of the island that that Luke's on. Uh, that's revealed like in the first, I think, ten minutes. Um, but uh, other than that, they they have no they have no purpose. They they don't they don't for you know they don't further anything. They don't really they aren't really that funny uh they aren't really that cute i i they're all they are is nervous that's that's about that's about the only thing they are um, yeah they're nervous because a certain person is trying to eat them yeah so, that's true okay so <laughs> yeah okay so l- let me just uh, that was jump really in. that was a really funny moment I that's what it. i'm saying like okay so l- let me jump in joel is absolutely 100 percent correct i don't disagree with him at all the porgs were extremely unnecessary but god damn it they're cute as hell and they actually yeah. provided for some of the the funniest little moments i actually thought they were adorable um i didn't think i i didn't know they were birds I, I didn't know they right. had like little chicken feet. Like I thought they were yeah. like little gerbils. And so the fact yeah. that they were like flying around is like, oh, I didn't I didn't realize that about them. We'll say like an, as an asterisk on them though, it's it's something to appreciate. And I guess this is kind of a positive, but I'm just going to mention it here. The fact that they're mostly practical effects is neat. Yeah, that, I didn't that's realize really cool. I didn't realize that either. Like until I think the day before, I saw it is that they were actually on set. <laughs> So, you know, there were things that were on set that were moving. Of course, uh, they were helped by visual effects in the movie, but um, but they were there. And so they were interacting with the cast, which was pretty neat to find out because, you know, practical effects. It's the, what this series is based in. Uh, and, you know, so it's – it's uh, so that was neat. But, yeah, the, just the, the creations themselves, it just – you know, I, I get what Ryan Johnson was going for. He's kind of mixing a lot of elements of a lot of the movies into this one. Uh, a lot of the original trilogy, I should say, into this one. And part of that was the Porgs being the Ewoks of the series, of this trilogy cycle. Uh, but it just it just kind of 
doesn't really it doesn't fall flat and it just doesn't do anything you know it just doesn't do anything basically well, joel, joel has no soul he didn't find them adorable or cute so i, I don't I guess, I can't help i guess you. i'm gonna be disowned among the the star wars like fanboys in which case i am totally fine with that <laughs> i'm not a fanboy i'm a fan of joel, a star wars i can't fan. help you when you say that you don't like porgs i can't i just can't help you sir like you're on your well, own. I am. I am just. I'm against pornographic imagery. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> how long have you been uh, sitting on that one? <laughs> a week and a half. All right. Uh, <laughs> I've been wanting to use that since I saw it. I knew that I would be able to on the show. Um, so yeah, I think that those are pretty much my negative. Uh, I mean, I guess the other things. Um, the the Benicio del Toro character is kind of red herring. Uh, I will get into why I liked that the movie included him anyway in my positives, though. Uh, but <sighs> okay. I think that the character himself, kind of as a as oh, a character, is a device. Oh, okay, so uh, you just brought up characters, and I completely forgot about this certain character because this said character doesn't pop up until like two hours into the movie. Um, one more negative. I don't understand how <clears throat> you can hire Gwendolyn Christie. And be like, oh, she's going to play Captain Phasma. Then The Force Awakens comes out. She's barely in it. And then she gets stuck in a dumpster. The Last Jedi comes out and she's like, oh, I'm coming back. You know, we're going to try some news. She did the same shit in this one as she did in The Force Awakens. She barely pops in there. And it's just, yes, cool Uh, little scene. I I don't have a problem with it because of how I think the series is going to go. But Uh, whatever, uh, whatever. I'm I'm talking... I'm talking the movie that was presented. It no, was... I know, but it's it's not it's not entirely a vacuum. It's part of a series. Uh, she was, you know, only in Force Awakens so much because of the fact that I think that she's going to be in Episode Nine a lot. So possibly, um, but as of right now, I just when you yeah. you're going two hours into it, and then she's like, she just shows up, and you're like, okay. <laughs> so I, listen, if she pops up at nine, cool. But uh, yeah. So okay. Final negative. I'm sorry. I just when I was thinking about, it, I was like, well, I was like, wait a minute. There's a character I'm thinking of. This is your last like, one. Oh yeah. I was like, she was like barely in there. All right. So uh, all right, Joel. Let's move on to the positives. Um, I, I I have to break this down like into sections because there's a lot of great things. So I'm gonna start with the man, the helm uh, of the movie, w- which is Ryan Johnson. Just to give you a little backstory, I have seen Brick and Looper, uh, two of his other movies. I absolutely love those two. Brick is like a neo-noir drug film in a high school. Very cool. And then Looper also stars Joseph Gordon-Levitt just like Brick does. And it's a time-traveling movie. It's one of Bruce Willis' best performance in many years. Uh, hopefully, Glass will turn that around, but that's another story. But uh, Looper was a really good one. So I was really excited to kind of see... What Ryan Johnson would do in terms of the writing and directing, because he is the sole credited writer. I, I wouldn't doubt, you know, that they had, you know, ghost writers or maybe punch up writers or whatever, but as the sole credited writer, he is it. And I like the fact that this is a writer, director, you know, tackling this giant ass franchise whose previous work was like a, a movie that cost like twenty million dollars. It's it's nuts. But um, to break down the actual writing, like I said, the story itself, it's it's serviceable, but I think what Ryan Johnson does particularly well is make me care about the characters more and really invest myself into this universe, invest myself into the old characters, new characters, environments. The way he constructs certain scenes are absolutely breathtaking. He incorporates really gorgeous cinematography, wonderful sound design, great uh, use of when to use, you know, um, the music and the themes from the older films and, you know, just, uh, you know, character arcs and, you know, the performances. I just thought as in terms of a directing side, the guy just kills it on a visionary level, uh, an emotional level and a um, uh, an acting level because, it, it, you know, a lot of people misconstrue that, you know, a director's, uh, you know, first job is to... Um, create the vision of the movie. Yes, that is important, but a director's main job for any film, by the way, is to get the best performances out of their actors. I've said this before and I'll say it again. In The Force Awakens, directed by J.J. Abrams, J.J. Abrams, I don't think, is a a really great director. He's a serviceable director. He's a better producer. But Ryan Johnson is a better director and this definitely shows bringing out great 
performances, whether you want to talk about Luke's final moments or you want to talk about you want to talk about Leia in the film or you want to talk about Ray, Daisy Ridley. Thank you for showing up. I thought you were good in The Force Awakens. I didn't really care for you in the murder on the Boring Express. So I, I, I'm glad that you showed up to this because I really love just everything that she had in this movie, whether it be, you know, on the island trying to train with Luke or, you know, certain scenes in the middle where she finds out some revelations and it really kind of hits her and realizes that, you know, uh, or, you know, she doesn't realize, you know, what she is. And it's just this whole movie just has great themes of, um, you know, not knowing where your place is in the world and, um, you know, acceptance. And it's just, it's just those little themes just kind of run throughout, kind of, uh, bring these performances out. Adam driver, this fucking guy. I just, I love him so much. Like in the force awakens, even though I thought that was just a, it was a good movie. I I love Kyle, Kyle Loren. I I really do. Like he, he's such a complex villain and we need that for this movie and not just some, you know, uh, you know, I'm bad, I'm evil, like, type of deal. Like, I'm glad that we have some complexity. We get to find out in this movie why he is the way he is or one of the triggers that uh, propels him to do the stuff he does. But I think Adam Driver, once again, great performance. Um, speaking of great performances, uh, even though they're not in the movie that much, uh, I won't say what happens to said character, but I will tell you that Andy Serkis as Snoke just once again proves that he is one of the best in the business, and it pisses me off that when you have this and War for the Planet of the Apes in the same year, he will never get touched by any nominations, and it's just an absolute travesty because uh, he's an absolute blast to watch. He's menacing. He's uh, threatening, um, and you believe every word that comes out of his mouth, and that has to do with Andy Serkis's performance. Uh, other performances, like I said, even though I didn't really care for their storyline, I enjoyed John Boyega as Finn and Kelly Marie Tran as a great addition as Rose. Uh, I actually really loved uh, Poe Dameron in this one, played by Oscar Isaac. I thought he had a wonderful character arc that, you know, in the first one, uh, Force Awakens, we see him as, you know, this guy, he has a lot of quips, uh, you know, he, he's a... Uh, he, he flies planes or, you know, jets or whatever the fuck they're called in Star Wars. I'm sure there's a, a specific term and it just piss people off. Oh um, yeah, sorry. Uh, sometimes <laughs> sometimes I forget, so just bear with me. Um, they X-Wings, buddy. Okay, sorry. Uh, anyways, <laughs> he's uh, he's an X-Wing pilot, and I thought he, he provided that charm and substance you would need for a, a you know, an X-Wing uh, pilot. But in this one, he does something to where you can see like a better future for him in future movies. And I actually liked his growth because it it felt natural and it didn't feel like it was forced or anything. It's like, this is what Poe would do. And I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm going to say right now, even though I liked, uh, Carrie Fisher as Leia, as I I have throughout the entire franchise, I'm sure Joel is, has the same burning question what the fuck are they going to do for number nine? That's all I'm going to say. Because it's kind of funny that the way the movie ends, you're like, okay, from the previous statements you've said about number nine, how is this going to happen? So I have no clue, but uh, I thought there were a lot of great moments between her and Luke that I really enjoyed. It was, they were very heartfelt and somber moments. They're kind of, you know, heart-wrenching, uh, especially there was one one that was like, you know, almost like saying goodbye to Carrie Fisher herself. And they were just, you know, it, it was nice. Um, let's see what else. L- like I said before, uh, certain scenes are the standouts, not the overall story. And just to, you know, c- kind of touch upon each scene, I'm kind of a di- uh, disagreement with Joel. At the, the island stuff was not my favorite part, but they were, they were good. Uh, they were fine. Um, uh, they provide for some good humorous moments. I'm going to say all of them were good. Uh, one of which involves lizard nuns uh, and the other, uh, the porgs. Um, but uh, yeah, I think Joel is absolutely 100% correct. The telepathic stuff do, does kind of overshadow the Luke stuff, but I enjoy the island stuff. All the stuff with Snoke, Ray, and um, Kylo Ren, wonderful. Such great, powerful character moments and realizations that. When you're sitting there, I, I sat there and I was like, I'm watching a Star Wars film and I'm fucking invested. Let's do this. Like, I, I was so amped up to just see everything uh, within that scene. Um, as far as uh, other characters' moments, uh, 
that's about it for the character moments. It's really that one that's kind of the the core for me. Um, and there's a couple of great stuff with like Luke and you know his realization of you know what's happened to the Jedi and all the for- First Order stuff. So that's really great. So moving on to the battle sequences. Even though there's not that much hand-to-hand lightsaber con- uh, combat, I will tell you, even from the opening to the very end to the middle stuff, it's just, it's awe-inspiring. It's, it's such wonderful realization of the usage of space and the ships and just um, overall uh, locations of all these action sequences, whether it be the opening sequence where they're, you know, fucking dogfighting in the middle of space, that also provides one of the greatest uh, emotional moments in the movie uh, with uh, one of the Rebels. That's all I will say. The movie starts out with a bang in terms of visuals, uh, story, and a certain character moment. It's just, it, like, I was just kind of floored that they just kind of started out their movie out that way. Um, all the Snoke uh, throne room stuff was really... Uh, uh, heart racing. I, I felt like I was on the edge of my seat the entire time because the um, uh, the anticipation it was just kind of building and just everything that happened within that room. It was just so good. And then the last scene uh, at the very end on that ice planet with the uh, uh, the red salt is just it was just fun stuff to watch. And I, I and that also has to credit to what I said earlier. The special effects are absolutely amazing, and, and Ryan Johnson doesn't overplay the special effects. Um, like I said, some of the creatures at, you know, uh, Casino Weirdo Island um, were a little, little hokey, but I think for the most part, he utilizes CGI quite well, and some of the uh, air battle sequences are just absolutely breathtaking, and I I still think that, that one, shot, uh, one shot with Laura Dern's character, with, uh, with her fate, is just, it's stuff like that that made me go, wow, Ryan Johnson tried something different. And, like, it, it just worked. Like, it was just so amazing that he amped up everything. Like, you know, whether it be the uh, the CGI or the acting or just sequences put together. Or, you know, uh, cinematography or just overall sound design. It was just, God, it was just so beautiful to watch. Um, and I think... Uh, I think that's about it for the positive. I think I hit... Pretty much on everything. I'm sure Joel will mention something and then I'll piggyback off of him. But I, I think for the most part, I think the positives outweigh the negatives so much that my grade, I still feel comfortable with my grade. Um, but I'm going to give it the grade I'm going to give it at because of the negatives. But uh, but the positives were just so overwhelming. And these, these small character moments that carry through this very average story elevate the movie to such a high level that I became fully invested in it and I cannot wait to see what happens with number nine. And uh, just another positive real quick, uh, because John Williams, the score was great, once again. Like, he he utilizes old themes um, to to kind of enhance certain scenes, but then he'll also spin some new stuff. Like, uh, my favorite kind of sound or uh, music bite was in the uh, Snoke's throne room and I love it when uh, composers use like that really creepy like orchestral like background singing to any type of music and he does that for Snoke's room to kind of uh, highlight Snoke and I thought that was kind of bone chilling so I really love that so yeah that's pretty much it for me I cannot wait to see what happens in number nine versus how I felt Force Awakens and I was like cool I can't wait to see number eight after this one Excluding those last 30 to 40 seconds, I'm like, I cannot wait to see number nine. So, Joel, take it away. What are the things that worked for you? And uh, th- please bring up some more stuff because I feel like I'm missing something. And uh, uh, you'll probably go into more detail. So, uh, what were some of the things you liked? So, uh, starting from the top, I guess I'll retaliate against your point about the um, Rose Finn subplot. I like this one a lot. Um, I like this this whole part of the movie because, uh, or maybe not the whole part of the movie. Again, you know the character of Benicio del Toro, who he plays, is a is is a device uh, for the movie to kind of move forward. But nevertheless, there's this sense that they ha- they're trying to find someone. They make the mistake of trusting that someone, and it all kind of you know turns turns on its ear for them. Uh, and I found that to be a lot of fun. I found the um, 
you know, the setting to be fun that they went to the, uh, you know, what, what the characters do there at the, in the, on that world is, is curious cause it adds a whole interesting dynamic, um, to, you know, just a new world. It's, it's really interesting to see that develop. Um, it didn't feel, uh, it, it didn't, it didn't feel derivative of Moss Eisley, uh, to me. So, um, that was nice. And then, um, let's see. So the performances from both of those two people are, are great. Kelly, Kelly Marie Tran is just about adorable. I don't know if you've seen any videos of her, uh, interviews. She, she's and a very warm personality. She is. There's this, there's this video floating around of, she took like a, uh, I think it was a Tumblr video or something or an Instagram video maybe of her sitting at a restaurant or a, or a pub in London, I think. And the people behind her are talking about her character, like with, you know, ad- admiration. And then she goes and interrupts them and thanks them and all that. And it's just, she's just, she's just adorable. And this performance is, is uh, a real star making one for her, not just because she's in a star Wars movie, but because she's terrific in a star Wars movie. And uh, it'll, it'll, certainly get her roles and i'm i'm excited to see where she can go uh john boyega was really solid you know a lot of fun i I think he has a lot of fun with this character interested to see where he goes uh i didn't have the problem that you had with with uh the what develops between them possibly but it's because of the word possibly that i'm that i'm behind it um so so let me ask you real fast then like because you you know exactly what i'm talking about with uh yeah, yeah the choices he makes at the end like did you feel so like it wasn't, that was it pro- wasn't, I mean, okay. So there, there's sort of a pair of choices. Um, there's, there's two people involved in that. There's his, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to duck around this. I'm, I'm really not wanting to, to turn people off uh, of this movie, but you know, there's his choice and then there's her choice after that. And I feel like it's not as simple as perhaps you think it might be. Um, I, I don't think it's leading to where I, I really don't think it's leading to where you think it is, but and that's, just, that's, that's why I'm okay with it. I think that they're, um, building, they're building a friendship. Um, and so I guess that's, that's the thing. I mean, it's not always as simple as, you know, what happens here. So anyway, um, even in star Wars, it's not. So, uh, remember that Luke and Leia once shared a kiss. So, <laughs> you know, it's never, it's never this simple. Um, anyway, actually Luke and Leia shared two kisses. That's the weird, awkward thing. Okay, about Joel, I told you not to part. mention incest on this episode. But, I mean, <laughs> if, if you want to do that, let's go there. All right, here we go. <laughs> Entering the incest part of this. Uh, no. Um, so anyway, um, let me think. So performance is there. Oscar Isaac, really good. A lot of, a lot of fun, uh, building his character up. To be somebody who has to confront certain things about himself, I thought I thought that that was really nice. Uh, that he's not just going to be the sarcastic pilot anymore. He's he's going to take on a more uh, responsible position in the narrative. Um, and also, adding on to that, the great moment at the beginning involving a phone uh, involving a phone call that was pretty funny. I like that. That was absolutely hysterical. I was almost rolling on the floor. It, it was just about great. I mean, it's totally stolen from the screen from I think scary movie but nevertheless it, it doesn't matter it was delivered the way Poe would deliver it as a character yes. and you're like that's perfect yes <laughs> and I love how and I love how the other person on the on the phone call I won't mention who it is the other person on the phone call um responds to that is is also perfectly within his personality so it's it's just it's just a great moment. Which um, uh, sideline just real fast, Joel. I apologize. Uh, I forgot to mention General Hux did not bother me in this one as much as the Force Awakens. I actually liked him in this one. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a lot of fun. He really uh, he sneers it up really nicely. Um, he's a very very. I think somebody called him impossibly British, which is a great way to put it. Because <laughs> um, he's incredibly proper, but he's also you know obviously a psychopath. Um, so. Going forth, Mark Hamill is good uh, as Luke. I, I, I think he makes a really solid return, uh, despite my you know feelings about how the character is kind of treated in the movie. Um, he's 
He's uh, he's terrific at one point. Uh, I'm just going to say it. He looks like Chuck Norris, uh, which which was very interesting to me because of the way the camera was framing him. Um, but anyway, it was very interesting. But I but I liked the honestly I liked the um, I I think you mentioned something where he throws something. It's literally like his first scene. I love that moment because no. that's his, like yes, <laughs> that's his crabby like. Uh, it's sort of the movie's like first method of throwing out the past. And I love that because they take this incredibly precious, uh, you know, object that's been stored away for a long time. And then he tosses, he tosses it off a cliff and it's just, it's great. Um, I will, I will say that I didn't like the way he did it. He could have done it a different way. I still stand by that. However, it does provide us with a pretty funny point. In the, in the, in the scoffing kind of way, I, I thought that it was fitting because he's crabby. He's not, he's not just sad. He's crabby. He's, he's, He's an older man. He's he's not you know engaged with people in a long time. He doesn't know you know how to how to talk to Ray. I think it's what six years or something. Um, so I think that the crabby sort of sardonic way he throws it off the cliff is is a fun little flourish that Mark Hamill adds. I don't know if that's how it was written in the screenplay. I, 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 the screenplay, I just but. I mean we're going to agree to disagree. I don't really care for it, but, but like I said, and I still stand by this. It does provide for a pretty humorous moment for the Porgs uh, when the yeah. thing is thrown off. Uh, so I will give it that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so then, um, so he's good. Uh, it's it's you know he was all he was kind of an uncertain actor in the original trilogy. I'm not I'm not going to completely say that every performance in the original trilogy is completely amazing. There are there are some that were a little too earnest, and I think that sometimes his was. Uh, probably not in Return of the Jedi. I think that's his that's his finest uh, work in the series. But um, but here he's good. He makes he makes a solid return. He reti- he reminds you, you know, it, it's immediately Luke, even if he's a little different, uh, a little changed here. Um, he's still, you know, there's there's the shades of the boy uh, here that I that I found nice. Um, and uh, Daisy Ridley, excellent, really finding, uh, you know, she and uh, Adam Driver, and I'll, I'll just mention them together. Really find nuances here that, you know, I don't even know if they were on the page. I feel like they just discovered them in their sort of feeling the performance out. Mm-hmm. That's 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 my that's my um, especially in the scenes between them. Let's say, uh, let's just call them the scenes between them. Uh, <laughs> it's just great uh, chemistry between them, and. Great performances on their own. Uh, there's a lot of conflict in in Kylo Ren in this film, and there's just as much conflict in Rey. Uh, and then you know, put them together, you have two people questioning each other's uh, motives and, and abilities, and it's it's great work from both of them. They find nuances that that they uh, that they previously hadn't had access to. Um, because of course, Force Awakens was always it was all about introducing them. This is all about complicating them a little bit and they they run with it nicely i thought carrie fisher was was good uh i don't really think the movie has a lot to do with her which is kind of sad because of carrie fisher's fate you're right i'm wondering what you know where they're gonna go uh i i'm sort of wondering less than most people because of her line of dialogue at the end of the movie her last one Mm -hmm. um i feel like that might if you unpack it a little bit that might kind of lead the screenwriters to be able to move forward without um, without her character. Uh, that's not giving anything away, trust me, because you have no idea what I'm talking about, listeners. Chase does. Um, but she was good. Uh, I just, you know, kind of wish she had more to do. She, she seems a little functional this time, uh, where, like, a lot of the decisions that she has to make because of the narrative and what it does with her character – are kind of put on to Admiral Holdo, who is the the Laura Dern character. Uh, speaking of which, I sort of share your thoughts about the character that Laura Dern plays. However, she's awesome in the role, um, and she gets the big hero moment. It's amazing. It's probably the best uh, use of or use of sound. Let's just say that uh, in the movie, or, or maybe the absence of sound. Well, I was trying to duck around it, buddy. Okay, so <laughs> well, they have no clue what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, we we are ducking around a lot. Trust me. Uh, the final negative—I mean, the final negative, the final positive that I will that I will say—and um, that's really all I, I have to say about the performances. The the 
um, not the final positive. Here's the here's the next positive. So throughout the last 45 minutes, I, a seasoned Star Wars fan, had no idea where any of it was going, and that's that's a pretty big thing. That, that's like, one of the that's one of the reasons why I love it because of its unpredictable nature. Yeah, it it goes in places that you don't expect. You don't expect. Um, well, really, it's not even the last 45 minutes. I mean, it's mostly the last 45 minutes, but it's the whole damn movie. <laughs> it's the whole it's the whole movie, but. I mean, really, even before that, it's, it's you know, it, it really shakes you up. I mean, like I said, it's sort of mixing a lot of the elements of the original trilogy, all of the movies, into one movie uh, that includes some plot points, that includes, you know, character moments um, and, you know, sacrifices that are made. And it's it's unpredictable and it's based in characters, and I love that. Um and uh, yeah, so then kind of getting to the direction, I think Johnson does a killer job at handling all of this mythology, which a lot of people take seriously. It's um, it's it's unpredictable. He shakes things up. He doesn't just you know hold their hands uh, across the street. He he leaves them. He leaves the audience to wonder what's going to happen next. And for the first time, I have you you can. It's interesting because I feel like all of the trilogies kind of mirror each other in a certain way. You know, you have the first movie in each of the series is about, to some degree, a young hero from a sandy planet who joins a rebellion just as they're, uh, you know, gathering together fighters to go destroy the enemy who has housed themselves on some sort of weapon of mass destruction. Like, that's that's pretty much The Phantom Menace, A New Hope, and The Force Awakens uh you know, before getting into the particulars of who does what when within that plot, that's pretty much it. So then you had Empire Strikes Back, um, had uh, – it wasn't really like Attack of the Clones so much. But then you have this movie, which kind of borrows elements for a while from both of them, um, you know, and then it just completely turns like a hard left. And I love that about it because it gives it, – it, it, it turns away from the reflective nature of the series. And uh, so it's going to be very interesting to see where episode nine goes. Uh, I'm, su- I'm super excited. It's December 20th, I think, 2019. Uh, I've, I've got it on my calendar um, because I, I just – I have no idea what's going to happen. I, I don't know where this has led us, whereas with the other movies – there was enough confidence in the formula of the Star Wars movie as a as an entity that I could kind of know. I mean, especially in the prequel series because it had already been established by the original trilogy. But even in the original trilogy, once you got past the revelation involving Darth Vader, you could kind of see, okay, this is inexorably leading to, uh, you know, Darth Vader's death, uh, probably by the hand of Luke. I think that, you know, people likely guessed that even if they didn't want to believe it, you know, whenever they entered the theater, uh, they probably weren't super surprised that it ended with a big scene involving them here. It's nothing you expect. Um, It's nothing you expect. This this movie challenges the very idea of the force. It challenges the usefulness of the Jedi. Uh, It challenges the audience to know or to to try to guess what's happening and at some point I feel like any audience member just stopped trying to guess because that's that's where this movie takes you it takes you on this unpredictable journey of character based uh, mo- uh you know character motivations that are that are based in personalities in the story um or in the in the ideas of the movie uh and there are a lot of ideas in this movie and it's just um, it's just really, really great. Uh, so it's just really great to follow all of that, you know, and not know where it's going. Well, and I have to bring that up. Like, why in the hell would you want to know what's going to happen? Don't you want to watch something and kind of be thrown for a loop? Like, uh, yeah, true. Uh, there is sort of this interesting, like, so there's a comfort in Star Wars, and that's why I think you know at the at the at the core of it all, even though they should really just put it aside and just accept it as Star Wars canon. You know, you had the the um, the petition thing that came up to excise it from the Star Wars canon this week. And 
I think that there's this comfort in the Star Wars narrative that people kind of get used to. And so when something shakes it up, they aren't really uh, you know, familiar with it, and thus they're not really comfortable with it. But for me, it's like just put that all aside and enjoy Star Wars for what it is, which is something that at one point completely shifted all of your perspective when it turned out that the big, you know, you know, the, well, not the big villain, one of the big villains, you know, Darth Vader was the father of the hero. That was a huge, huge thing. Imagine today's Star Wars fans reacting to that. They would hate it. They would hate it. If, if, if you had, and, and, and I, and like, follow me on this. So if for whatever reason, the original trilogy wasn't made when it was made and it was being made right now. And we only had the prequels to work from. Um, well, actually the prequels would, would inform that. So I guess that wouldn't work. But if what I'm, what I'm saying is like right now, okay, let me start over. So right now, if the prequel, if the, if the original trilogy were made right now and people were starting with the fourth episode in 2015 and then the, the, fifth episode in 2017 and people found out that Darth Vader was Luke's father they'd riot they 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 would they would hate it right now as the Star Wars fans sit watching the series they would hate that because it would it would completely you know kind of ruin their their ideas the the comfortable ideas that they had for the series going it was a huge huge twist and now here we have something that doesn't go along with that kind of a twist it's not some revelation involving parentage. And, you know, you have new ideas, things that are challenging. And I love that about the series, that it can, that it can do that at this point in it. And for me, it's just, it just hits, hits, hits. And um, so, yeah, I, I, just, I just love it. Um, I, I, I just love that, that Ryan Johnson was able to be so ballsy with this movie. So that's really my final positive. I mean, uh, you know, you could talk about the visual effects all day. They're great. They're they're generally outstanding. I mean, the action scenes have have pizzazz, and the editing is amazing. Steve Yellen's cinematography is is uh, terrific. He he works with um, Ryan Johnson on everything he does. I'm pretty sure, except for the Breaking Bad episodes, probably. And uh, you know, he he turns out stunning work here. It's uh, the sound design is obviously, you know, Star Wars and kind of invented sound design, um, essentially for for big blockbusters like this, and it's impressive again. Um, so you can talk about that all day. It's kind of a given that all of that works, but it does work. But really, my final positive is, it's a ballsy movie. Uh, not everything works, but it's it plunges forth to. Despite the fact that it missteps, and that's that's an ambition that, you know, you can't expect from Pirates of the Caribbean Five or something, you know, some some cookie cutter thing that that means you know nothing in the long run. This actually has plot development and stuff that means things, and it's just and it's just terrific to watch it um, to watch it unfold. So that's pretty much my list of positives. I'm going to hand it over to you for your final thoughts and grade. Go yeah, I, I think you you kind of nailed it and kind of summarized this whole movie experience. Is that it's ballsy, and I I I think this is why it's, it's my favorite one in the franchise because they took risk. Like you said, not all of it works, but I think for the most part, for me, it hit me on a certain level um, to where I became so invested into this franchise within two and a half hours, and this is the eighth film in the chapter series. So um, most of the stuff worked for me, but that Finn and Rose storyline does kind of hinder it for me uh, to justify my grade. So I was going to just give it a straight up A if it was fine, but uh, that storyline does derail the movie because that is a good chunk of the first two acts and it does kind of slow the pacing down. So for that reason alone, but it's still a wonderful movie. It's not going to be my top 10, but I stand by this grade. My favorite one of the franchise so far, A- minus for Star Wars The Last Jedi. All right, so guys, get a pen and paper out because you're going to want to note this for all of future. Like I want people to write this to Chase when he's on his deathbed to remind him that at some point in life he gave a Star Wars movie a higher rating than (laughs) me, a slightly higher rating, 
than Joel Copeling. Um, and that's actually quite shocking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm giving it a B plus, so it's not like some super, you know, low grade, but it, it's a B plus movie for me. I, I think that the stuff with Luke, um, and some of the stuff with the humor kind of, kind of drags it back, but it's very strong. Uh, and it has a lot of emotion, you know, it's sort of like one of those in between B plus and a minus things. But on first glance, I think the force awakens works a little better. Uh, just as an experience um, in in terms of the seamless kind of storytelling uh, and character building. Um, but that'll probably change, honestly, by, by future viewing. So we'll, we'll see if that stays that way. But for now, I'm just I'm going to give it a B plus. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to stick by that. I, I gave it three and a half stars on my website uh, and I'm and I'm that's in that area. So. Um, See, th- this yeah. is what I like about Joel because we're so different. Like you know, he described it perfectly. Where like number seven is a great experience. It's a for uh, a formal event where it's like it just gets you back into the Star Wars zone, and it's a comfortable viewing going experience. This one is ballsy, fucking weird as shit, and I loved it. And I, I like th- this is why I gravitate towards this more um, than Force Awakens because it's just it's so out there, pun intended. That it's just it kind of blew me away. I'm like. How all these sequences <clears throat> defied expectations, crushed any theories that were out there, and just did its thing. It was unpredictable, and it just went all over the place uh, in terms of um, um, characters and uh, reveals and whatnot. To where I was like, "Yeah, I kind of love you." Uh, so yeah, th- th- those are our grades for the last Jedi. And before we get into the Shape of Water, um, Joel is going to briefly discuss the the wonderful turmoil. That was with this movie uh, across the interwebs. Joel, what in the <laughs> fuck is happening? <sighs> All right. So, goodness gravy. Um, here's the thing. Uh, there's no – I hate saying this to an audience that's listening to us, but here's the thing. There's no There's no fan base. There's no extreme fan base, I should say. I, I should probably put that um, – this cl- like the the modifier on it. There's no extreme fan base worse than the Star Wars fan base because um, this week there were there was a lot of pushback um, in terms of like you know people wanted it out of the official canon. People thought that um, uh, this was the most offensive thing that the Rose character was some SJW or S- whatever they're they're called. Yeah, SJW social justice warrior nonsense that. They were that they were trying to elevate the the characters of color over the the white ones, um, so much so that on the Wikipedia, which is Wikipedia is the official Star Wars wiki. Um, ha 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 ha! That's uh, cute. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, I'm gonna super I'm gonna, cute. I'm gonna remind you of the the uh, the name of that website every day for the rest of your life. Okay, so oh, um, on the wiki <laughs> on the Wikipedia. Uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just before I say what they put on here, I'm, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to say the name that they gave the character. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance on the, on behalf of the white race, uh, for this. And I also don't mean any, uh, I guess this is a content warning. I don't mean any sort of like, um, offense to any lis- listeners of Asian descent, uh, but on the Wikipedia, somebody came in and changed the name Rose Tico to, I think it was like Ching Chong Wing Tong or something like that. Uh, it was it was something along those lines, and it was it was an incredibly offensive, uh, you know, name to to give that character, uh, played by an actress who was born in the U.S. So that makes it even weirder. She was born in. Um, uh, San Diego, I believe. And yeah, so that happened. Uh, horrible, horrible thing. And they're, and they're, and they like put some text into it. That's not for listening ears. Uh, uh even our, even of, of our show. Uh, you know, if you want to like have the, the nerve to go look it up, you can, uh, it was screenshot. On, it was it was screenshotted or screenshot, whatever, uh, on Twitter and you can find it somewhere. I'm sure I tweeted it out. I think, um, and it was, it was incredibly offensive. So that happened because there are, you know, uh, there are white, there are terrible white people among the, the Star Wars fan base. And some of them had their, uh, had their fun quote unquote 
this week. Um, and guys, this is this is to you, fan vo- fan voice. <sighs> Get over yourselves. It's Star Wars. It, there are so many more important things going on in the world right now than your precious Star Wars being slightly up, upturned by the ways of the world. Uh, if you are, you know, somehow stuck in the 1940s where, you know, women had to answer to men about everything and uh, people of color were were subservient to you, okay, fine, whatever. I, I guess find a time machine. I'm not sure. We're in 2017. And this is getting ridiculous. And uh, you know, just broadly, the 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 preciosity, if that's a word, of of the Star Wars narrative, isn't rigid. It's been changed and molded uh, throughout the years. And you know, this stuff is canon. Rogue One is canon. Star Wars: The Clone Wars is canon. Um, and I didn't even mention that movie. I, I don't remember it, so I, I won't I won't say anything about it. But uh, that one's canon. The prequels are canon. You know, the 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 fan base. You, you know, the movies are not specifically for you. Of course, movies are made to have fans, but movies are not made for fans. Ryan Johnson had an idea about the Star Wars universe that he wanted to go forward with, and he did it. And now you're you're lashing back by trying to remove. Uh, the the movie from canon and silence the characters that might actually uh, you know provide some representation for the underprivileged. Are you kidding me? That's the pet- the pettiest thing you could possibly do. I thought somehow we were past this at some point. You know, I I felt like uh, this past couple of years had at least that much growth in empathy. Uh, maybe the last twelve years since uh, Revenge of the Sith. Apparently I was wrong. Apparently everybody is still as petty as they were when they were slightly disappointed in the Phantom Menace um, had like this online platform and then it all kind of transpired into uh, George Lucas Rape My Childhood. Um, uh, you know, just rhetoric and, and, and all of that. It's just, <sighs> just get past it. Accept that this is Star Wars watch episode nine knowing that this stuff now happened and cannot be changed and the movie cannot be remade when they're already in pre-production for the next one because if they remove this then the next one won't make any sense and then if you really like the next one and you don't want it removed guess what you've done you've removed a middle part of a a series from the canon i mean not that they're going to be able to do that but i'm just saying theoretically if they were then that's what would happen You'd have a, a a third trilogy cycle where the middle part is missing, and now it doesn't make any sense. So stop being petty, get over this, and be fans of something. Love the Star Wars that you love. Don't hate it. And because right now I'm not convinced that you don't hate it. And uh, so that's my little PSA to everybody. <laughs> yeah, uh, li- listen, I realize that uh, you fanboys don't get that much sunlight, so you know, no vitamin D for you. You're always like. Uh, being hermits in a basement somewhere. So I, I get it. You don't get to interact with people. And so when you see something that you supposedly love and, and you bash it and you want it removed and, you know, you act like a child, it's just, you know, I, I get it. You don't have any sunlight. You, eat, uh, you do nothing but <laughs> eat Hot Pockets in your mom's basement. I get it. I totally get it. Um, but maybe you probably shouldn't be a little bitch. Um, maybe. Yeah. There's this There's this tweet um, from this uh... – I've, I've, I've had, I think, like one interaction with him maybe once, and then uh, I've never had any other interaction with him. But it, basically the entire like thing is summed up in his tweet where he basically says that the Rose character, uh, you know, he's, he says essentially I'm not racist uh, in the way that, you know, means that he's racist. He, he basically thinks that the Rose character was trying to, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, it was trying to take away all the all – the, uh, the uh, thunder from the white characters and that he's all for quote unquote uh, characters of color being in power in this, in this series. But, and I quote, not this way. And it just begs the question. So what way, what way would we, would you be up for other than having a heroine uh, in the series? I, I don't understand that, you know, and 
this happened when Finn was, you know, was positioned as a hero. It's the racists came out then and they're coming out now. And now, you know, uh, combined with the sexist, the racist sexist, basically, basically uh, this time. And yeah, it's just, it's just, be. I, sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> moving on with my PSA. Go ahead. I, I didn't no, mean that. I, I was just going to say uh, what it boils down to is if you are a racist or a sexist, you can go fuck yourself. If you are complaining that this movie didn't meet your expectations or your weirdo th- fan theories that you just conjured up in your basement um, and it didn't go the way you planned, well, I'm sorry. Stop whining like a little bitch. Get over it. It's a part of the canon now and accept it. Now, yeah. like if you so just – one, you, one, well, final, well, one I was, final – I, I was just going to say like if you just listen to Joel and I like – we're not like some, you know, um, you know, family. It's just like, oh, I love everything. Like, oh, God, I just love it. It's like, no, we, we have actual issues with it because we look at it as a film and we ju- we view it as its 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 own entity. Now, and, you know, if we it took me practice, it took me practice uh, years of practice to get there because Star Wars is something that is very precious to me. You know, there was a time for me when I was an undiscerning you know person. And I would just give all the Star Wars an A because I just I didn't look at them as movies. And and if I was still that person now, that's probably what I would do with this because I, I would be ignoring the issues. Exactly. But, what, what would be the point? Like what right. would be the point if Joel just came out and was like, I loved everything A. It's like, no. You, I haven't you, engaged I haven't engaged with the movie. No. There are, there are there are faults with this movie. You know, the the really intense fans who don't find anything wrong with Star Wars aren't as annoying, but they they can be kind of annoying as well. You know, be at least a little analytical about the movies that you love. Uh, and, you know, here, I loved it. I can I can honestly say that I loved the experience of watching this movie. That doesn't mean that as a movie it's perfect. Um, and then the final thing that I just I just wanted to say uh, to, to kind of put it into the racist, sexist stuff. If you're a racist or a sexist, then we don't need you on our fan base. You, you, you aren't a fan of Star Wars because Star Wars is inclusive and has always been inclusive. And you can just you can just leave. We don't need you in our fan base. You you, you kind of have uh, you know interrupted that yourself with your prejudices, and there's no room for that. Not only just in 2017, but in the Star Wars universe, uh, it's it's actively trying to fight back against that. And for for you to try to dredge it up again and make it you know some political statement of your own. By the way, it's not just a political statement on the movie's part. It's a political. It's a political statement on your part to to take some stance against it. Then you know if you don't like political statements, then just get out of the fan base. Just stop watching them. Don't keep watching them and keep and keep complaining about this stuff because you just come across as more and more racist. So it's it's just yeah. So there you go. <laughs> it's the same with any fan community, like you know whether it be like comic book movies or Star Wars or Lord of the Rings. It's like I appreciate like talking nerdy with like other people that appreciate stuff that I like and just, you know, talking about stuff and like, oh, what do you think is going to happen and all that stuff and like, you know, just really just explore the lore and the mythology. But then when you start getting like those parasites in your fan community, it brings everyone down and it makes everyone look bad. So if you are that person, just stop it. You're a grown 40-year-old man that's probably, like I said, never seen sunlight in your day. So your Casper looking ass so should, I don't know, interact <laughs> with people that might help your your weirdo like obsession psychopath shit that you're going on. So just Precisely. stop it. And if, and if we get hate comments, I, I don't really read them, but Chase does. And I can assure you, like speaking on his behalf, he's probably just going to ignore them. So don't even really bother to send them because you won't get an answer. Uh, with this stuff, we won't trust me. I, I've been tro- I've been on the internet for many years, and I've been trolled a lot. And at this point, I just don't care. All right, so uh, <laughs> moving on uh, to the the uh, other big review. I mean, we talked about stars for almost an hour and a half, but that's okay because it was Star Wars. Uh, but this one does uh, deserve that much of a length because it is uh, absolutely one of the best films of the year. But I'm gonna go ahead and just tease Joel by saying that I may. Or may not have it on my top ten list. And I'm going to go and just throw him into a tailspin. Uh, but the movie that is in question is uh, The Shape of Water. Uh, directed and co-written by Guillermo del Toro. Who has brought us, you know, Hellboy, Pan's Labyrinth. Um, uh, Joel, I'm blanking. <laughs> uh, uh, Pacific Rim. Uh, he's, uh, he's done Blade 2, Pacific yeah, Rim. Blade 2. Uh, Crimson Peak from Crimson a couple Peak. years ago. Well, that one's kind of forgettable. Uh, so, uh, I like it. It's, it's whatever. 
All right, so for for this one, you know, with the trailers coming out, like I was already excited for it because I, I always loved Del Toro's vision. He's a unique visionary that just always has his own voice cutting through the industry and just doing his own thing, and I really appreciate that. When you watch this movie, it is definitely something as unique as Del Toro. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just come out the gate. I'm going to say I loved it. Um, I don't have, honestly, that many issues with it. There's couple tonal things, but that's about it. Um, this is more of a praiseworthy film. Um, and I, I've listen, I, I've, I saw it a week ago and I've sat on it and I honestly just can't think of anything that jumped out to me that was just like awful or anything. So Joel, uh, your overall or what are your initial thoughts and, uh, go ahead and, um, kind of bleed into the plot for the audience. Yeah. So this one's kind of a hard one to, um, to, give a premise for because there's sort of like star Wars. There's a lot of uh, surprises here, but essentially it follows this mute woman uh, named um, uh, Eliza, who is a janitor in a top secret facility. And uh, she begins to bond with a creature that they are keeping in there for some reason. I don't know if they've bred it or have captured it. It's kind of unclear. Um, they're sort of – I think that they're kind of testing it for further capabilities, but I don't know how it got there basically. I don't think that's really ever spelled out. Uh, but she begins to bond with it. It, it sort of – it has the, the physiology of a man just uh, mixed with a fish, um, but it's as much man as fish, let's just say. And she falls in love, and they they um, actually end up you know having a physical relationship. They have a romance. They – uh, but uh, aside from all of this, there's a lot of Cold War related stuff um, involving a thriller element with uh, a character played by Michael Shannon. Um, and yeah, there, there's a lot more to this movie. Um, and oh, and I should say the 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 fish man, I think he's uh, credited as amphibian man in the in the um, credits. Yes. Um, and played by Doug Jones, who's uh, Guillermo, who's who's a Del Toro regular. He um, played a couple of characters in Pan's Labyrinth. I think he played the one that's on the poster, and then also the with with the horns, and also the um, the the thing in the hallway with the uh, eye on his hand. Uh, and I think maybe one more actually. I think he played like three in that in that movie. Uh, he played um, Abe, yeah, Abe Sapien in, in uh, the Hellboy movies. He was, I think, one of the um, the the spirits in Crim- Crimson Peak, and of course, he's done work outside of uh, Del Toro's filmography. <laughs> Most disappointingly, he was the Bye Bye Man earlier this year. Joel, which... <laughs> hold on, it is December twenty second. Now, I saw that movie almost a year ago, and I told you, and I told everyone in my life. To stop bringing that goddamn piece of shit up. We are done talking about the Bye Bye Man. It is not Doug Jones' fault. It, he was just a poor innocent man that got caught in a train wreck. Just stop bringing up that shit. Okay, so uh, the Bye Bye Man is an awful film. And you should never see it. Ever touch it. Don't go near it. If you find it in a Walmart, shoot it with a bow and arrow 200 goddamn yards away. And then burn it at the stakes. Burn the building down. It is one of the worst films of the year. And I'm done. <laughs> Joel, you bastard! You knew that you 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 knew you're gonna set me off by announcing that shit. <laughs> okay, I gotta calm down. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so he's in but, the Bioman. But no, all serious. No, uh, serious is no. Uh, uh, the Bioman is just absolute garbage. Do, is, do not see I it. think he also played the um, also an awful movie, but he also played the ice cream truck guy in Legion. Oh yeah, that was uh, that movie. Movie. yeah. He was the, with the wide mouth. That was actually a cool <laughs> part of that movie. I didn't I didn't like it, but uh, he he was he was the best part. Anyway, he's done a lot of basically like physical performances. Um, he's he's uh, you know there's another one that's that's kind of become uh, famous. Javier Botet, who is Mama, uh, a couple years ago, and he's he's kind of risen. But Doug Jones is, has sort of popularized this trend of really like physically capable actors playing these uh weird otherworldly roles and he does a terrific job here it, it, um, like to be honest with you he i don't want to say the dollar version but he is on the same like level as like uh like an andy circus it's just he doesn't yeah. get as much recognition 
Yeah, for if Andy, I mean Andy Circus is is motion capture uh, what Doug Jones is to um, uh, prosthetic. Yeah. Uh, acting and there's a little bit of motion capture here too. I I know that a lot of it was makeup and um, and costume, but there there is some visual effects, and I think that might be why it was um, uh, disqualified for makeup and hairstyling at the Oscars. But um, anyway, so. Yeah, I, I'm like you. I love this movie. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and get my negatives out of the way and say that I don't have any. I don't even have any problems. Oh, shit. Son. Yeah, I don't even have any problems with the tone. And also, if people are, you know, like fairly uh, uh, attentive to my, my style of reviewing, you know already what I'm going to give this movie <laughs> because I have to have nothing wrong with it. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't have any hangups. I, I, I think that the tone is very much in, um, and I'll, I, I guess I'll get to that later, but the tone is very much in, in, in line with the rest of the movie's uh, modus operandi uh, in terms of what it's trying to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't have any problems with this movie at all, and I loved it. Uh, it's absolutely one of my favorite films of the year. Um, I've already intimated heavily to, to chase this, but yeah, it's, it may or may not be, but probably is, but might not be, but likely is on my top 10. <laughs> Thank you for that weirdo, um, like moving around yeah, with that answer. I was, I was trying to duck around it by, you know, not ducking around it at all. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay. So here, here's a, uh, and this has nothing to do with the movie. This is actually just me talking out loud. Joel knows what other movie I saw that night. I saw a double feature alongside yeah. The Shape of Water, and I got to be honest with you, as much as I love both of those movies, I'm leaning towards the second movie as my favorite on top of this one, and that one might go on my list. This one might not. I don't know. Like, I have to, like, th this is the difficult thing about this year is that there's so much goodness. It's giving me a headache to, like, reform my list every week. So, um, Listen, I love this movie quite a bit, um, and the negative doesn't, like, hinder my top ten uh, chances at all. It's just, th listen, guys, first of all, this year is extremely tough for the top ten. And second of all, the top ten are movies that spoke to you the most. I can acknowledge that a movie is fantastic. I can give it an A, A+, plus, or A-. minus. You just saw me do that with Star Wars. But that's going to go nowhere near my top 10 because it didn't reach out to me as much. Now, Joel knows what type of person I am. I'm kind of a fucked up dark person. I am going to gravitate towards the second movie I saw that night more than this one. But I can acknowledge that both of them are on the same level in terms of technical and emotional qualities. So, so basically, they're probably in your top like five or something. Exactly. Like I said, I'm, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm kind of. I'm listen. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm unsure where this one is going. I am actually positive on where the second movie is going. But for this one, I will say that the negatives for me, and this only happens in like the last, I'd say, twenty minutes. And I know Joel's gonna roll his eyes because I'm about to contradict myself. This movie is a fantasy romance. It is fantasy, sci-fi fantasy. So, with this type of genre, you can suspend your disbelief just a little bit to where you can actually, you know, whatever's presented in front of you, you can kind of take with a grain of salt because Del Toro sets this world up as a sci-fi fantasy film and it's going to have some otherworldly things in it. So, you can accept that. However, I will say that there are a few moments and scenes towards the end that did feel a little goofy and felt a little a little too cheesy where I was like okay I get what they were going for it's a kind of like beautiful magical moment but it was a little too cheese ball for me and I think Joel knows, knows which one I'm talking about um and I get it it's supposed to have like this fantasy you know type of feel it's gonna feel you know not really as grounded even though I actually do think the movie for the most part is grounded which is actually quite an, an achievement considering the genre that it's going after. But there are, are some times towards the end where it gets a little, a little too cheese ball -y And I was like, I like what I'm seeing, but at the same time, my mind is going, okay, does it have to be like over the top like that type of deal? But that's it. 
Uh, honestly, spoiler. Well, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler. I don't know what he's talking about. All right, uh, go well, ahead. well I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll <laughs> tell you at the end. But uh, uh, when well, we get done recording, um, so that's my only hang up. Uh, so to dive into the positives, uh, very simple for me. Um, Del Toro, I him and uh, Sally Hawkins are the stars of this film. You want to talk about vision? Del Toro nails it. When you want to talk about the wonderful sets that were built and kind of submerge you into the 60s, or you want to talk about the costumes that everyone's wearing, you want to talk about the CGI or the prosthetics or just the overall like point he was trying to go for the movie, it's simply magical and beautiful. Like Those are the best ways to describe this movie. Now, what Del Toro does is very interesting. Uh, I didn't really pick up on this until someone else said this on one of their reviews, and uh, uh, so I don't take credit for this at all. But they were they were saying that you know back in the day when Universal had all their monster movies, you know you had like the Swamp Thing, who was viewed as you know this creature, you know no one really understood it, so everyone was trying to kill it, and you know that's you know it's sad when you think about you know the theme in that movie. And so what Del Toro does, once again, not taking credit for this, is that he flips it in this one. I didn't really think about that because I was just watching the movie as presented. But what Del Toro does in this one is he flips it to where the creature is, yes, feared by some people, but for the most part, loved and accepted by others. And that is the difference. When you have a main character that is mute, she can't communicate with anyone. And she's communicating with this thing that doesn't really care that she's a mute. She just, or this, you know, this amphibian man just talks to her and just opens up dialogue and conversation. And so what Del Toro does is that he taps in to that fear of not understanding the unknown. Like, uh, for instance, uh, you know, don't want to get political, but when, like, homosexuality or gay marriage... When you ask any person that's you know against it, they close off. They don't open up their minds. They don't. They don't talk to anyone. They fear it, and they just automatically condemn it. So what Del Toro does for this, which is very poignant, because not only one he's poking at uh, you know racism themes, but also sexist themes, to where he's taking that time frame and he's pl- he's <clears throat> you know plopping this romance in the middle of it and showing what happens. When you can talk to someone or talk to something that understands you and you can communicate with them and not be so fearful of them like Michael Shannon's character who's deliberately only there to take this creature down. But that's how most people would act uh, in this scenario. But not Sally Hawkins. No. She is a wholesome character that finds love in the most unexpected places. Um, And I guess going off to Michael Shannon's character... A lot of people are just going to look at him and go, oh, he's just, you know, some standard villain. No, he's actually a pretty subtly complex villain, but he's one of these guys who thinks that he's right. He thinks he's right the entire time. But we see him as a villain because some of us actually have souls and emotions to where when we see him harming this creature, we go, well, this guy's kind of fucked up. But in his mind, he goes, what I'm doing is right. I'm trying to protect people. Uh, he's also kind of a dickbag. Um, but, uh, uh, you know... You have characters like that, or you have characters like uh, Octavia Spencer, who has got basically a double header going for her, where she is a woman of color and she is a woman uh, in that time frame, and she has to deal with the bullshit uh, from that era as well. Like Joel said earlier, Richard Jenkins' character, he is essentially the heartbeat of the film. And going back to the homosexuality thing, he um, has to face uh, certain type of things as well in terms of. Um, you know, discrimination. I will just say that. Well, I, I almost, I feel like I just gave it away, but whatever. Uh, it's not like it, it, that's going to like blow your mind if you already know that. But, but he, his character also speaks upon the times and how everyone closes him off from society. And that's what's so wonderful is that this romance between um, Sally Hawkins and this, you know, fish man is so beautiful because they're the only two people in the movie besides Octavia Spencer who un- who understand each other, who find a a mutual love that no one else can explain and they don't it's they they don't have like this, you know, 
just fear inside of them that most of these characters do. They just, you know, they go, they go with the flow and they realize that they're right for each other. And there's just, I don't know. There's just something kind of, just kind of beautiful about that. Uh, but going back to Del Toro's direction, I know that I'm all over the place. Once again, Joel's a professional. I am not, um, (laughs) With Del Toro, he, you know, added, like, striking visuals to kind of get his point across, but also heighten this kind of fairy tale aspect about the film, which I, once again, really enjoy. So he applies grounded real-life themes and characters and settings into this fairy tale fantasy scenario, and I just thought the um, combination between those two genres actually worked out pretty well. He also had, a, you know, some subtle things in there, uh, directing-wise, um, I'm not going to say what happens, but Michael Shannon is married in the movies. Uh, something happens with his wedding ring, and it is not to be found for most of it. And I found that, like, I don't think anyone else picked it up, but, you know, when Del Toro is kind of poking at the times in terms of racism, discrimination, and sexism, he's also poking at traditional conservative family values and how, uh, you know, the world saw family values as like the end all be all like that's what you should be and then people would view homosexuality or you know people of color like with disgusting attitudes or maybe even this romance with disgusting attitudes and there's something he does del toro with michael shan's wedding ring like his character where it's gone and i'm like oh shit del toro just shattered the um uh, American way in terms of marriage and conservatism and family values. I absolutely love that because uh, what, as I was watching, you know, there's uh there's a sex scene between Michael Shannon and his wife and it's very aggressive, very awkward. And it's like, that's what people love. They love the, uh, you know, American way. They love marriage. They love straight white people. And it's like, no, Del Toro just basically made his and character handicap of a, a wedding <laughs> ring. And it's like, he was, he was saying something and I love that. It was and stuff like very, that that was wonderful. And it's this very sexless sex scene. It's yeah, oh, exactly. It's completely unerotic. And <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it, it just it just plays along with the the wedding ring thing. I was like, that was probably my favorite part about the movie. Uh just little thing like a little thing like that that really spoke volumes about the whole nature of the movie and the, all the themes and uh everything. Um let's see, other positives. The performances, I guess, all around, because I talked about the characters. Uh, really well done. Sally Hawkins doesn't say a damn word. Uh, I will say maybe, maybe not. Uh, she doesn't say a damn word throughout the entire movie, but yet she conveys so much emotion, uh, through her sign language, through her facial, uh, reactions. It's absolutely wonderful and superb. And you feel everything that she's feeling, uh, with her and the fish man or her by herself, her with Octavia Spencer. She's really, uh, a, a well-rounded character. Octavia Spencer could have had a little bit more to be argued with, but that's not that's not a negative to me. It's just like it's whatever because we it's do still, this. It's still a fine performance. Yeah, it, yeah, it's still a fine performance. Her character does have a family scene, but it felt a little too too little too late. Where it's like I feel like there could have been more of that, but whatever. It's not really a negative for me just because her performance was so good and the overall movie was just so powerful and what it was trying to go for. That little stuff like that didn't bother me. Um, uh, another uh, thing that didn't really bother me is there is a certain thing that's revealed about the amphibian man uh, at the end. And I'm like, oh, so that's the route they're going with it. And I'm cool with it because, like, I'm just like, you know what? We're we're inside this genre uh, that you know can take these liberties a little bit, and I- I'm cool with it. Um, and I'll explain to Joel after we get done recording. But um, other performances, Richard Jenkins, wonderful. I haven't seen him do um, a somber performance in quite a while. Like, you kind of felt for the dude. He felt just like a, an average day person that's friends with uh, Sally Hawkins. And, you know, they just had this, you know, very understanding friendship. Uh, and it's just, it's a sweet, it's a sweet uh, little relationship. Um, everyone else, Michael Shannon, come on. Do I need to say any more? This guy's a fucking, like, miracle in the industry. I've loved pretty much everything he's ever been in. I've been a fan ever since I saw him in... Uh, Oh shit! What was? Oh man, it's escaping. Was it eight? Was it Eight Mile where he played Eminem's dad? Because he was, no. he was Eminem's dad in Eight Mile. <laughs> Holy shit! I didn't even realize that. No, I, yeah. I'm, try, I'm trying to think of the first thing I ever saw him in, and then uh, after that is when I started seeing like the springing 
of his career a little bit. He's like been in everything, but Michael Shannon to me, he is a treasure. I just absolutely love the man. And he gave one of my best performances last year. And one of my favorite movies last year with nocturnal animals, he always kills it. And this one, he does a fantastic job. Cause once again, his character is not just raw, raw, I'm going to kill. It's like, he is raw, raw, raw. I'm going to kill this creature and abuse him. But at the same time, it's like, he thinks he's doing the right thing. And it's like, nah, fam, you're not. Um, but I'm glad you think you are. Uh, cause that's the way that character would think. Um, let's see who else. Um, oh, um, uh, Michael's is it Stuhlberg? Yes. Stuhlberg. So he was really good. Uh, I really liked his character. Like there wasn't, uh, a lot of screen time for him, but every time he was on screen, his character was meaningful and it wasn't just like some throwaway. And I, I kind of liked his, uh, little character switch that he had. And, um, his little uh, sideline kind of story character, you know, arc type of deal. So uh, on on top of the performances, you have, like I said, wonderful visuals that really highlight the colors and the sets and just really kind of have this adult fairy tale feel. Because um, we should reiterate this. This movie is rated R. So don't be thinking this is some PG, like yeah, Beauty this, and the Beast this is movie. Not for kids. <laughs> no, it, it's a uh, it's a graphic movie. Let, let's just say that there there's some full frontal nudity, folks, uh, and it's not just from the Fishman, um, which I <laughs> found very unexpected from both parties. Uh, but uh, no, uh, yeah, this, uh, cinematography is just absolutely gorgeous, and you know this is an adult fairy tale, and I think it highlights that through the colors and the overall vision that Del Toro has. And there's definitely a couple shots in this movie that would make it onto my like perfect shots list throughout the entire year. Uh, it's absolutely just stunning and breathtaking. Uh, the music. Forgot to mention it, the music is absolutely wonderful. It adds such a unique layer to the film where you're watching the movie and you're like, I'm really enjoying this, but then the music kicks in and you're like, this just adds to the whole experience. It adds to the overall um, uh, kind of weirdness of the movie, but also the heart of the movie. It's just, it's very encompassing of the film and I thought the the score was just, it was just a nice little touch. There's there's whistling in this the the score, which is a, a a nice touch, it was unexpected, but it worked. And uh, when I, even when I got to the dire, like dramatic scenes, like towards the end, like the score would change up a little bit, but it was still involving. Like it was a wonderful score. It was very enchanting. I guess that was the word I was looking for. But I think I touched upon everything. Um, but I think what it boils down to is Del Toro taking a trope uh, like a monster movie, applying it to the '60s tackling um you know racism tropes sexism tropes uh uh discrimination uh, against homosexuality or you know making a stance on conservative family values and marriage like i just thought all that it was it never felt like it was hitting over the head it was just all there and present for the movie but it made sense for the movie cuz it also applied to the romance between the amphibian man and Sally Hawkins um, so I didn't think it was like intrusive or whatever. I thought it was just nice little subtle touches and a really great way to incorporate that into an adult fairy tale, which we don't really get, excuse me, that often anymore. Um, the last one I guess you could argue was Del Toro himself bringing Pan's Labyrinth, uh, to the big screen. So, um, I, I, I just thought everything about this movie was just simply magical and Sally Hawkins surprised me because I didn't really remember seeing her in other movies like yes I'm aware that she is a seasoned actress and she's been in a lot of stuff but honestly I couldn't really pinpoint and then when you look at her IMDB page you're like oh yeah that's her um but I think this is definitely a standout performance and if I had to take a stab in the dark this movie's best chances for any type of awards consideration um cinematography music Richard Jenkins for supporting actor Sally Hawkins for Best Actress. Uh, I do believe Del Toro has a 90% shot at getting Best Director, and I think it'll be lumped in with Best Picture. So those are my positives for the movie. As you can tell, I'm pretty high on them, except for, you know, like I said, went a little cheesy towards the end, but I can excuse that because it didn't really take me out of the film. I was just more noticeable than anything. So, Joel, take it away. Why is this movie so special? And why is it, why is it going to ultimately make that top 10 list? Because there, there has to be something about it. That's good, right? It's because literally nothing about this movie should work 
no, uh, it, it really shouldn't, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it really shouldn't. It should be this uh, ungainly mixture of elements that comes together uh, and feels false every step of the way. Uh, it should be this disaster. It's not. It's the exact opposite of that. And it's because Del Toro has the vision. Um, honestly, I'm considering giving him my best director um, uh award because of this achievement of <clears throat> mixing all of these elements and making them into something that feels like it organically breathes and uh, is its own thing and it's it doesn't feel like anything else uh, that I can think of in, in recent memory. Not even Del Toro's movies. I mean, it has sort of that adult fable kind of feel of Pan's Labyrinth, but it goes in a completely different way. Um, it kind of has that fairy tale um uh, those fairy tale like elements that you know the Hellboy movies had. Um, it has the earnestness of stuff like Pacific Rim, and uh, but it's it's its own thing. It's it's not a just a simple conglomeration of a bunch of other Del Toro movies with weird stuff in them. It's it's its own story, and it shouldn't work, and it does. Uh, this thing is a a literal fish out of water comedy. Uh, there's a lot of really funny stuff here. It's it's actually a comic structure I found, uh, because a lot of the drama of the quote unquote drama of the, uh, of the movie surrounds gags with uh, setups and payoffs. Um, so if you think about it, it's a comic structure, um, but it's also a Cold War thriller and a really effective one, surprisingly violent one. Uh, that's another reason that this is not for kids. This is not something to take your kids to at all. I'm I'm gonna like. Sometimes I'm I'm a little lenient with with some of this stuff like you know what go ahead but no this is this is incredibly dark stuff uh surprisingly violent uh a lot of the time and uh but better for it because it's 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 uh it makes it more raw it makes it grittier uh in a certain way and then there's a musical sequence uh I won't get into why or how that that happens but it's one of the most amazing things of the year uh, and it's this, you know, like you said, it's sort of this allegory for uh, queer romances that isn't isn't um, isn't isn't forced. It feels it feels like it genuinely is standing in for one. It's something that people don't understand, especially in the period of time in which these people are living. Um, and it's between, you know one person it's between one person and and you know another figure that she de that she deems a person that she loves uh beyond any understanding even on her part of uh, of the relationship and um it's it's really beautiful the the um you know there's another sex scene let's just say and it's sweet and it works even though you know even though who, who it's between and that's that's part of the film's test for us. Will you find this a sweet scene as it develops? And it does. It's it's um, you know it's not sexy or whatever because there's not nothing really here that's sexy, but it is it is romantic. Um, there's you know there's fantasy. There's a there's a sci-fi element to this. It's a really good sci-fi movie. Like you know that getting to another part of its heart is that it is a movie about a creature from another world who or from you know, deep within our world, perhaps, who, you know, has surfaced. And that's a very sci-fi idea, you know, going back to Creature from the Black Lagoon and and all of that, Godzilla, E.T., whatever. Uh, no, not Godzilla, King Kong, sorry. Um, King Kong, you know, all of these, uh, a little bit of Frankenstein in there, you know, how, how, uh, how they sort of keep him in a lab. And um, it's all of these just beautiful elements and then so breaking it down into specific parts the performances are amazing uh doug jones uh, again really compelling uh physical performance doesn't have anything to say uh obviously but it's it's uh it's a great performance um nevertheless you know just on a physical level on a on a logistical level um the uh michael shannon terrific i mean he plays a villain like nobody else it's it's a it's it, but it's not a simple role. Uh, it's it's like you said. It's very complex. There's there's a lot of layers to his his um, to how he operates. You know he's a bit of a pig, 
but he he you know has at least tendencies toward some level of compassion even if it's even if it's uh you know to advantage himself ultimately um and so that gives him a complexity uh he's certainly the villain of the piece though and then you had uh michael stuhlbarg you know, you know like you said it's um uh, it's a great little it's a great performance that is easily kind of overlooked in the rest of the cast because of um, it's, it's a bit of a quieter performance than the other ones. Same with Richard Jenkins, who is just amazing. I think he's the best of the cast, actually. He's, um, you know, this housemate of Eliza's and he's and he's amazing. Um, and then Sally Hawkins. Wonderful, uh, you know, um, to play to play a mute woman. Um, is a challenge because I mean you you know their vocal cords don't work so you can't you can't even like have a little you know noise it's it's a very challenging role uh, you know to deliver the whole thing in sign language um, and just and gesticulating uh, if it's not sign language it's 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 a great performance um, and. Yeah, it's just a superb, superb cast all, all around. Now, the best, the best technical element of this movie is the cinematography, and I'm just gonna say it: this is the best cinematography of the year. Uh, it's it's stunning shot after stunning shot. There's um, there's no shot here that doesn't look completely beautiful. Even the most mundane thing is made to look utterly gorgeous, and um, even like the, the, the hallways of the lab, you know, are just kind of sickly brown. And I was sort of reminded of uh, A Cure for Wellness, the cinematography in that, where it made this, these sickly white colors really pretty, really, really um, kind of creepy, creepy pretty. And here that's, this, that's the same thing. It's this place with a lot of secrets in it. And it conveys that through the, uh, through the imagery. And, um, but, I mean, just elsewhere, it's, it, it utilizes light and shadow in a way that is uh, – utterly mesmerizing i was i was glued to the screen um and it's just it's just beautiful to bold every single shot uh specifically like there's some underwater shots that are amazing uh there's several actually in this movie and um those are just those are just amazing and and part of that is through the cinematography uh you know mixing all the blues and greens of the water in with you know, this image of a wide shot of the characters and, uh, that's repeated a couple of times throughout and it works both times. Um, and it's just, it's just a beautiful movie visually, the, the makeup and, you know, uh, practical effects work and all of that is stunning. It's, uh, it should be up for multiple Oscars. It's sad that it won't be up for the most prominent one of those. Uh, I'm hoping that they've decided you know, perhaps uh, the voters, you know, have already kind of decided if The Shape of Water is, is um, and it is eligible for visual effects, that they'll probably be nominating it because I feel like if they disqualified it for makeup, that's where they're going to put it. So I'm really hoping that that's in the five uh, because it deserves it. It's it's not, you know, visual effects shouldn't just be about CGI. These These should be at least nominated. And uh, because they're they're stunning, and um, you know the film editing is just is quixotic. It's it's um, it, it moves along at this at this pace of you know kind of in 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 between playfulness and nerve and nerviness, I guess. Um, that's just absolutely fascinating. The screenplay takes on a lot of things. That's why I want this to be nominated for uh, screenplay as well for Del Toro and uh, um, Vanessa Taylor, who, who co-wrote it, um, because it's a, it's a complex series of character arcs in the midst of this plot that goes in all different directions and hits the target on, on every one of them. And um, so I'm trying to think. That's uh, the music, like you said, beautiful uh, Alexandre Desplat. I really hope that that gets nominated. I think it, I think it might be, and I think it might win. I, I probably I, I'm pretty sure I mentioned that a few weeks ago, um, but I, I hope it does. It's it's a great score. It's um, it's lush and beautiful. I like the um, 
Uh, also, a little detail that's just kind of a nerd thing, I guess. The use of a quote of the day calendar becomes really, mean, really meaningful. Um, I noticed that over the course of the movie, there's there's quotes of the day in this thing, and it and it happens to correspond with the the movie's uh, themes as they as they develop. And I thought that, that was really neat, um, uh, an interesting way to incorporate. Um, sort of blunt blunt ideas like that because they're they're non sequiturs you know they they just uh incorporate the ideas from those into the storytelling is really interesting and um the whole finale of this movie is is just a wonder to behold the the twists and turns that that happen um and again the violence that occurs is not for kids but it's it's one to it's one to see in a theater um, if you can, if it's still around you, I know that this is kind of, you know, slow going at the box office, but if it's around you right now, go see it in a theater. It looks gorgeous. Certainly if you have a 4k player or a Blu-ray player later on, that won't hurt. But, uh, that first time I feel like it needs to be in a theater. So go see it in a theater. Um, so Chase, I'm going to hand it over to you for your final grade. Yeah. I think what it boils down to, <clears throat> like Joel said, None of this should have worked, but what Daryl Toro did was he actually successfully combined all genres into one film. He did action, comedy, romance, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, and it all fucking worked. So I'm indifferent to pluses or minus on this one, Um, even with the slight cheesiness and goofiness of the negatives. I'm just going to give it a straight up A. I'm cool with that. I'm comfortable with that. I need to see it again uh, to feel the need for a, a plus or, you know, maybe I maybe the cheesiness bothered me a little bit more. It might go to a minus, but I think I'm never going to go below an A minus. Like, this is always like an A quality movie for me, and I'm comfortable with just saying solid A. A plus for me, uh, I know y- y'all probably guessed that was coming uh, whenever I intimated it. Uh, I don't have a problem with the cheesiness. It very much falls in line with the rest of the movie. Uh, the earnestness uh, here, it, it, I think that's a better word for it. But um, nevertheless, I think it's pretty much a perfect movie. It shouldn't work. I, I will note, uh, I did not review this on my website. It was just sort of a, a casualty in the month It's that's been. <laughs> uh, I will certainly have my say, though, in my top ten. Uh, and I just, I guess that's kind of revealing it, but, uh, you don't know where it is yet though. So I guess that isn't fully revealing it, just that it'll be on there somewhere. So, uh, I'll have my say in my little blurb there, uh, to make up for the review that I, that I missed. Um, so yeah, uh, an A plus for me an a for, uh, chase. And then also, um, B plus for me on star Wars, a minus for chase. Tell us what you think of these movies. Um, and, uh, yeah, just let us know in the comments below. Uh, and also let us know what you think about these next two movies because guess what? I have extra reviews for you guys. Uh, and I'm going to just go ahead and jump into these. So uh, the first one that I'm going to do is the one that I liked less just to kind of not, – not because it's bad. It actually isn't, but uh, just because it will take less time. So the first one is Downsizing. Uh, this is a new film from director Alexander Payne, and it's a weird one. It's gotten a lot of uh, – Mixed reviews uh, recently. I I was intrigued by it. I wasn't like super excited, but uh, this you know decided to make it one of my final movies that I would that I would check out just to make sure um, you know my thought my own thoughts on it. Uh, forget forgetting all the uh, the reviews that it got, and uh, you know it's pretty good actually. Um, so this one this one quite surprised me. It's a weird one. Uh, it's a bit too long, but basically the pro- the premise is. That uh, a in the world of this movie, which doesn't really take place in any specific time period, it's never clear whether it's in the present or not. Uh, scientists have discovered how to um, shrink the mass of a person, or of, or of I'm sorry, of organic material uh, to I think it's like point zero three or. I think it's point zero three six four percent or something. I tried to remember the number. I, I I'm not sure if that was it, but. Um, in any case, there, the, uh, humans are shrunk to, are, are able to be shrunk to eight centimeters. And, uh, the idea is that they, uh, the scientists want to save the planet from, uh, you know, a certain death, uh, a, a certain fiery death from global warming. 
And so they figured that uh, reducing the population's uh, literal size will reduce the population's numbers, uh, at least, or the, the, the space that they take up, uh, meaning that, um, that, you know, money actually mean is is worth more in this world because people use less there's this great scene in the in, in literally the opener where we see that four years of compost waste uh can with you know with these um they've, they've tested on 36 individuals and four years of compost waste fills a single hefty trash bag so you know you can see how like that would cut down so you know the idea is that this would save the world and so Matt Damon plays this guy named uh, Frank Safronic and Frank, I'm sorry, Paul, Paul Safronic. Wow. Um, who uh, he and his wife played by Kristen Wiig decide to uh, shrink themselves or get small as the, it's called downsizing the official procedure, but people kind of like just call it get small and they decide to go get small. Um, I guess this is, this is entering weird semi-spoilery territory, but I'll just say that Kristen Wiig's character isn't in this movie for very long. I won't intimate why um, or anything, so don't try to guess from me not intimating why. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she's not in there for very long, so he kind of goes, uh, goes on it alone, uh, this adventure of, of being small, trying to find himself. And he, it, What's interesting is that the one of the uh, more clever jokes of the movie is that he at first regrets this terribly, um, but ultimately what happens is he um, befriends a Vietnamese dissident played by Hong Chao. Uh, I won't tell you her backstory because it's a very big surprise and it, and it factors into the climax, but she is a Viet Vietnamese dissident, a, a prisoner essentially, and um, also his upstairs neighbor played by Christoph Waltz. And they go off to uh, kind of discover the secrets of this of this new existence. Um, so, <clears throat> kind of starting off with the negatives because there are more positives than negatives, for sure. Um, this movie is too long. It's 140 minutes, and it doesn't need to be. Uh, it's a quirky comedy. There's dramatic elements, but it is primarily a comedy, and it does meander in the middle with this big excursion. Uh, involving uh, his uh, Matt Damon's uh, relationship with Christoph Waltz, um, you know, there's this like extended like 15 minute long scene where he gets high. It's way too much, and so there's there's that kind of stops the movie in its tracks. Doesn't really seem to actually have a point, other than the fact that oh wow, there's a a, a lot of you know designer drugs uh that have been made small now um and then it it uh it ends with the climax which is just one amazing thing after the next but for the for that middle it's it's not it's not great um and it really caused me to wonder you know man you know where's this thing going uh another thing i suppose you know, related to that is Christoph Waltz's performance is, you know, it's fine. It, it, I love the guy, but he's not really put into any particular use here um, beyond kind of being a device for, for Matt Damon's character to move forward uh, in the plot. And that became, that becomes really uh, kind of annoying because he keeps coming back and into the narrative. And it's just, anyway, uh, it's just kind of, frustrating um you know the movie doesn't have really a distinctive look to it it's uh Payne's usual cinematographer uh Faden Poppenmichael who does solid work you know here and there he did the he did the black and white work on Nebraska for instance that was really good but he it's it's not it's sort of like it looks like a sitcom a lot uh honestly or or maybe not a um uh you know the ones um recorded in front of audiences, but like a 30 rock episode or something just has that visual scope of, of a sitcom episode. And, um, so that, you know, it's just like nothing to look at essentially. Um, and then some of the ideas, it reaches a little farther than it probably, 
can sustain itself to reach. Um, certainly some of the ideas are, are a little undercooked. Uh, the main one isn't the, the one involving the environment. It really does go far into that. But there are other things that it tries to touch on, and it just doesn't really seem to have the capacity to do so, especially considering it only really tries to confront those ideas in the third act after not really having anything to do with them until that point. Um, and it's and it just kind of uh, uh, comes in too late to, to really do anything about it. But those are the negatives and the, and the positives outweigh it. The, 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 the fact of the matter is that this is such a wacky mixture that it's a lot of fun, even if it's uh, dragged out fun. It's a lot of fun uh, in the early stretches of the movie to see how we, we have this alternate universe of small people – uh, that completely works um, as its own, you know, functioning economy, and also affects the outside economy. And you know, while we don't really get to see the outside world past a certain point in the movie, uh, it's it's it always kind of haunts the rest of the movie. You know how how the outside of the world is doing, and so that's really that's a really moving idea, uh, and that's that's one of the things that the movie goes really deep into, and and. Uh, actually genuinely confronts and I and I thought that that was appreciated uh, but really what the movie is is this just wacky comedy about an alternate universe with small people and that makes it work because the actors are so willing to play this material both sincere and satirical and so that's that's really nice, you know. At the forefront, Matt Damon, he's good here. It's not some great Matt Damon performance, but he's solid. He's he's offering up solid work, better work than he did in Suburbicon um, earlier this year. And this is a better, you know, dark comedy kind of satire than that one is for sure. Um, and uh, you know, Kristen Wiig for her for her brief period of time is is. Uh, very good as his wife. Uh, you know, I already said Christoph Waltz, he's fine. It's just nothing character. Um, there's a, uh, I don't even know the actor's name. I didn't look this up. I probably should have, but uh, I haven't started on my review yet, so I don't know. But uh, the actor who plays the the scientist who discovers this method, uh, you know, first he's in the opening scene and then he comes in at the end and he's terrific at the end. He, he plays this weary man um, you know, why he's weary, I won't, I won't reveal, but he's, he's very weary of, of all of this that has happened and he's just kind of escaped and it's, and, and he's done with, he's just done with life and it's a very good performance. But the miracle performance of this movie is Hong Chow. And I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say this, um, it's one of like if I were to have a top five performances of the year by anybody across any um, category, she's in my top five. Um, and here's the here's the interesting part about this, because I feel like I'm going to meet a lot of um, criticism, perhaps among listeners who uh, feel op- the opposite way, feel the way that I'm about to. Um, to talk about there's there's been some backlash uh regarding the movie's treatment of this character uh who again is a vietnamese dissident she comes with a very strong vietnamese accent and broken english and so the easy way out is to say that she's this stereotype of a vietnamese immigrant but the character as written starts out as a cliche and then immediately pretty much completely throws away anything cliched about the character uh, on paper or the, the, the foundation of the character on paper. Uh, she's a woman with real uh, dreams, hopes, aspirations, uh, regrets. Um, she covers the wide range of human, human emotion basically in this role where she's limited by her accent uh, to be able to convey it you know, in the language that she was born with. And so it's a very complex role, and <clears throat> Chow plays it with such conviction. Uh, there's this beautiful moment that's going to definitely be her Oscar clip if she's nominated, where uh, she wants to go on the journey that ultimately Matt Damon goes on, and her impassioned defense of herself 
is made me choke up. I'm just going to say that. And it's hard to do that for me. Uh, and in the middle of this movie, that's this wacky comedy that I don't even particularly love. That'll be uh, reflective in my grade. Uh, that's, that's pretty valuable. Uh, you know, tears stream down her face as she tries to, you know, make this plea. And it's in a way that's not just overly emotional as some people might, you know, suggest some sexists might suggest that a woman is being overly emotional genuinely she wants to go there and uh to where to where they're going and she explains it in this way that conveys everything that is meaningful to this character and about this character and it's a beautiful moment and it made me choked up just the conviction of her convictions <laughs> and so that's it's it's an amazing performance i could not keep my eyes off this person she's going to be hopefully nominated for this and then get lots of roles in every movie. Uh, that's, that's what I'm hoping. Um, so that's it on the acting. It's, it's pretty strong. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, it's, you know, solidly directed by Payne. It doesn't really look like much, but he, he handles the, uh, the narrative turns pretty well. He and the, the co-screenwriter Jim Taylor and, uh, yeah, I just I, I found myself surprisingly entertained by this, so I'm going to be giving downsizing a B. <clears throat> um, so Chase, does that sound interesting to you? I mean, when I saw the trailers, like you know, it, it is what it is. Like you said, it almost felt like you know this goofy like satire that you know could go either way. Like, is it going to go full blown like stupid com- <clears throat> comedy or have some dramatic elements in there? And I, I like you know. Payne's other work so I mean I'll give it a shot down the line and that was going to be one of the movies um, I was going to see in the coming weeks but you know limited amount of money you think I'm going to choose that one uh, no I was going to choose this next one that Joel's about to talk about <laughs> right right yeah which is uh, a bigger priority um, so the next one is Call Me By Your Name um, this is the new film from director Luca Guadagnino uh, now, I've been sort of cold but admiring on this guy's work. He, he directed, I think this is his third film, he directed I Am Love and A Bigger Splash. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of I Am Love. I know it has a lot of defenders. Um, I felt like it was overly dramatic, uh, overly melodramatic, sorry, and a little false, felt a little false at the end. Um, a Bigger Splash was a little better. I kind of liked it, but it's still pretty heavily flawed. Uh, it suffers from some of the same problems. And with this movie, but again, both of those movies, especially as a bigger splash, have ardent defenders. They people love these movies and love his filmmaking in them. And with Call Me by Your Name, I finally feel like I understand what they were seeing because uh, I felt I was a little aloof. Um, and man, this movie is amazing. Uh, Every single element about this movie works. There are no flaws. Hey, guess what that means? <laughs> so here's the story um, of this one. And actually, it's interesting that we're moving from The Shape of Water, which is an allegory for queer romance. Is it moving on to a queer, a queer romance? Uh, this one is about a young boy – not a young boy. Um, an older boy named uh, Elio who is played by Timothy Chalamet. Uh, he has joined his father in somewhere in northern Italy. Uh, for a summer, this is um, this usually happens. The, the the father goes somewhere for a summer, and brings along a student in his class. He's a professor of um, uh, old school sculptures and art and, and art stuff. It's uh, actually looks like a pretty interesting class. Um, and this time, the father has brought along a, uh, a a bit of an older man named Oliver, played by Army Hammer, and you get to you get to see kind of the it's basically there's really no plot per se there's a premise and that is that Elio um, discovers that he cannot resist this older man and so they fall for each other um, over the course of the summer at first he can't stand him but uh, he's kind of won over by his his charm his uh, his physique let's just say and um, you know, they, it's it's a pretty passionate affair, and but it's also kind of transitory because it's a summer, um, and you never know what happens at the end of a summer, and 
So it's all about sort of the the melancholy and the joy of that sting of first love. You know, we've all we've all had it at some point, hopefully by now. If you're if you're you know my age or Chase's age, uh, you know that thrill of the first, uh, um, the initial attraction, the uh, you know the 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 heartbreak that ensues. All of that is captured here in one of the best performances of the year. Another of those top five from from Timothy Chalamet, who is a revelation. Like this guy's in Lady Bird, he's really solid. I hadn't seen him in anything else, to my knowledge. Uh, before Lady Bird, so that was my first um, brush with with his acting, and here every single tiny little nuanced uh, like element of the character's personality is so perfectly and com- like just perfectly conveyed by every moment of Chalamet's performance. It is like you can't take your eyes off of him, and when you can't, and when you can take your eyes off of him even though that makes no sense. You can't take your eyes off of Army Hammer, who is also terrific. Uh, interestingly enough, I feel like he's a little miscast. Uh, that's not going to affect my grade at all because he's still great, but he doesn't quite seem to fit the age of the character. Uh, Army Hammer is older and looks older than the character is supposed to be. I think he's supposed to be like 24, uh, and Army Hammer is in his 30s and looks like he's in his 30s. So... Uh, that's a little that's a little distracting at times, but it's really not even a problem or a nitpick. He's still great, um, and uh, you know he he's he's as this older man who who has experienced what Elio has not experienced, and he's a little guarded. He's a, he's a little he's a little more adult. He's he's had those heartbreaks, and he's learned to guard his heart a bit. And now, you know, he just. Uh, he kind of wants to protect Elio, uh, but he's also undeniably attracted to him. They again, they have a pretty passionate affair. It's it's a romance, and um, you know, and those scenes are are uh, maybe not as explicit as apparently people want it, want them to be. I don't think that they need to be explicit per se, but uh, certainly they they do convey the passion of the of the affair here. They do a really good job of that, um, particularly through the cinematography. Um, and that's my that's my other positive. Oh my gosh, this movie looks like a postcard in every scene, but except not as processed as that sounds. Um, uh, the cinematographer is a is a person. I actually don't know if this is a man or a woman. I'm I'm sorry, I didn't look this up, but this person is named Sayambu Mokdipram who has done a couple of like really mid-profile foreign indie titles uh, in the couple, last couple of years, but this is the first time he's worked with American actors on a you know semi-major Fox, uh, I mean a uh, um, Sony Pictures Classics you know big prestige movie, and uh, this guy's this guy or woman or whatever uh, is going places, whoever it is, uh, is going places. Uh, this person is going to be shooting movies for a long time. I can I can feel it because. This is going to resonate with people. Every single shot in this movie is gorgeous. Uh, it makes Italy sometimes look uh, mundane. Sometimes it looks picturesque. Sometimes it looks like another planet. Uh, it's it's amazing. It's uh, there are times, and and Chase will understand this. There were t- there were times where this made Italy look like under the skin made uh, Scotland look like. Um, or Wales or wherever that was shot. Um, so do you know what I mean by that, Chase? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it looks alien sometimes. It looks like we don't actually live on an earth that is this beautiful. And it's it's gorgeous. It's it's just perfect every, every single shot. Um, the editing is fantastic. It has this leisurely pace that is just this lazy summer. It, it almost feels like... Uh, a before from from the before trilogy, it feels like a Richard Linklater movie, uh, in its pacing, and uh, you know a little more a little more uh, 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 physically passionate than a than a Linklater movie might be, but it's uh, it's exactly like that in the pacing. It's 132 minutes. It it uses every minute to make you consider everything that you're seeing, uh, everything that's happening. It gives you that time. Um, 
And it all leads up to probably the shot of the year. I'm not going to say what it is at all. I wouldn't do that anyway, but also for Chase's benefit for tomorrow or whenever he's seen it. And um, it's likely the shot of the year, uh, to be completely honest. It's this – it lingers on something and it gives you the time to just stare at it as the credits roll. And it's – just absolutely amazing and also i guess like the big um you know thing that uh, went through with press is that there is a uh <laughs> let's just say that um timothy chalamet timothy timothy chalamet i have to remember that they rhyme um performs an act with a piece of fruit I know exactly what you're talking about because some stuff that, was some stuff was spoiled for me. I was like, "Oh, okay. this is like a this is like a prestigious is, American Pie." <laughs> it is. It is basically like something from American Pie, just turned serious and crucial for the character. Yeah. Um, because it is a crucial moment. The the uh, without that moment, honestly, without this this um, uh, what he does to a peach, uh, which is comparable to what Cameron Diaz did with that windshield. Um, <laughs> Why'd you bring uh, that movie up in this conversation? <laughs> hey, I was just reminded of it. I was, I was thinking, like, man, at the Oscars, if if Tim, if if Timothy Chalamet and Cameron Diaz uh, uh, walk up to each other, and Cameron Diaz has seen this movie, she'll probably just be like, "Hey, man, I did that with a windshield." Anyway, um, <laughs> so so people have seen The Counselor and remember that scene and kind of apply windshield to Peach in this movie. You'll kind of get an idea of where I'm going with this, um, but it's actually a really uh, a really crucial scene. Without it, uh, I don't think that there is uh, a, a a crucial part of the uh, the climax that would work, and it would actually deter the movie um, from its goal, which is to present this romance that blossoms and you know. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It may or may not even reach an end. I'll just say that it's. It's very. It's very uh, suggestive. Apparently, there's like a sequel in the works or something, uh, or a, you know, a companion piece. I guess a continuation. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if we need it. I, I. I would certainly like to come back to these characters. I. I feel like this is a self-contained story, though. Uh, in itself, we we learn. You know, everything that we technically need to learn. Uh, if they have something else to offer, though, I'm obviously curious to see it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, this movie is just amazing. Uh, and also Michael Stuhlbarg's amazing. There's, there's this climactic uh, moment where he lays out some stuff for, for his son. He plays uh, Elio's father. And they come to this understanding that is remarkable. It's nothing you would ever expect from that sentence. Um, and it's about nothing you'd ever expect from that sentence. It's, it's really amazing. It, it ties up this, the, the movie in this bow of, um, untidiness. Basically it's like a, an untidy bow, if you will. And, um, anyway, it's just a perfectly calibrated drama. There's, you know, light moments of comedy. There's, um, just, even the 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 members of the cast whose names I don't know are perfect. Um, they, you know, during all of this, Elio is sort of kind of romancing a girl. Uh, oh, played by Esther Gurel. That's 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 her name, and she's really good. Um, and anyway, it's just it's just a fine drama all around. It uh, it is written by an a legend in the screenwriting world, James Ivory, who was part of the ivory merchant team for a long time before they kind of just stopped making movies. Um, in 2007, I think they stopped making movies and, you know, he did stuff like Howard's Inn, remains of the day. I think room with a view was theirs. Um, I think that they were producers on shadowlands. I'm not quite sure about that. That's the CS Lewis story. Um, you know, stuff like this is, it's, it's set in a period of time that's before our own that takes place with a lot of, um, you know, period production design, which is beautiful here, by the way. Uh, I feel like they just shot it in an actual house. I'm not quite sure, but the, the features of the house are unpredictable uh, to some degree. 
and um, it feels like a lived-in house. And anyway, it's just it's just it's just a perfect movie. And also also the two Stufian Stevens uh, Stevens songs that are the original songs, uh, you know, written for the movie uh, Visions of Gideon and Mystery of Love are absolutely astounding. Oh my gosh. Not only the songs on their own, but how they're used in the movie uh, is amazing. And so keep an eye out for that. Uh, they both show up in there. And um, if anybody watched uh, David Ehrlich's uh, video of the top 25, he used it, uh, I think, for movies like 7 through 5 or something, or 7 through 4. I can't remember. Anyway, he used it somewhere near the end of his video. It's uh, kind of slow and uh melodical it's it's just just beautiful and so yeah just all of this stuff oh and the score i can't remember who did the score but whoever did it uh killed it it's beautiful score so i just i love this movie man I, I, it's it's amazing and um so i have a feeling i have a feeling i'm gonna predict something right now because i feel like the movie your name is on your top 10 and that when you see this tomorrow, this will be on your top ten. So that literally two movies this year involving the words your name and the title will be on your top ten, which is uh, going to be going to be amusing. So and that, anyway, that, uh, that could be the case, <laughs> right? Um, so I can't wait for you to see it. I can't wait for you to get back to me on uh, on what you think or you know whether or not you're you're shaking crying. There were there were moments in here that that I got choked up as well. So like literally two movies today uh, made me choked up, and that's hard to do. Um, I saw these both today, by the way. So it's just yeah. So good good movie watching day, uh, and I'm gonna give Call Me by Your Name an A plus. Well, gee, I was expecting nothing less. Uh, no, I, I'm <laughs> I, I'm excited for it. This thing has been hyped out the ass uh, for shit, yes, and like- Sundance. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's been it's been going on for almost a year now, so we're finally it's finally here. We're finally getting it, and uh, yep, I will be seeing it less than twenty four hours, and I cannot wait. That'll be that. Uh, it, it's gonna be poignant because that's gonna be the last movie I see for the entire year before I finalize my list, and I'm just gonna be straight up with you guys. There's I think like three or four movies that I will not get to. And it's not because I don't want to. It's because Joel and I don't get to see everything for free. And everything, you know, we, we right, get to see yeah, ha- right. half the screeners for free or half the movies we see for free and half the movies we got to pay for. That's not a problem. I don't mind supporting film. But I'm also, uh, you know, a person that has to pay bills and shit like everyone else. So I have to, you know, pick and choose. And so my final two films for the year are going to be I, Tanya and then uh, Call Me By Your Name. So that's what I'm doing tomorrow. And then after Call Me By Your Name, I will finalize my list. It's gonna be wonderful. I can't. Uh, I can't wait to finally yeah, finalize where, that. Yeah. Whereas, bench. whereas a lot of the uh, critics were able to see, you know, out in like L.A. and stuff, were able to see Phantom Thread. We have not been able to, and so that's that's a movie that I will probably add on, like if it if it qualifies later on. But we'll be reviewing it on the, um, or are we? I think we're reviewing it on the show, right? Pretty sure. Yeah. So on the nineteenth, I think, or the I mean the twenty first episode. So. Um, I think that's, I think that's the episode. So, uh, yeah, it's just like, that's the, that's the big one that's missing. Whereas we have seen the post. Yes. Uh, it's weird. Like we, we saw the post in November, but yeah, we can't yeah. see phantom threads. Like it's whatever. Thread, yeah. <laughs> well, and what's even weirder is that focus features, uh, is, is releasing phantom thread. We got to see darkest hour and, uh, they sent Victoria and Abdul as well. So it's like, well, if you send those two, why didn't you just send the whole damn package? Like, it's just, yeah. it was weird, <laughs> Wh- whatever. But I still thank all the studios for sending me out this stuff because Joel and I did a binge fest a while ago. I, I finished off and, uh, watched some more. So I, I, I do thank all the studios and hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that Joel and I will get to that point where, um, you know, we will get to receive a lot more screeners and get to review these for you guys because, I mean, that's the whole point is that we just want to get you guys excited for not only blockbuster yeah. films but for, like, independent film and, you know, just support that. And I always love supporting smaller films, so it's... Yeah, uh, we don't we, we, we don't like the general idea that we have to do, for instance, a top ten episode before we see Phantom Thread, which, you know, might, for all intents and purposes, be, you know, pretty near the top, might be pretty near the top of our list. Um, you know, but we just can't see it in time. And so it's just, you know, 
I mean, it, it, I mean, because the the guest that we're bringing on for our top ten episode, this guy, this is his job. So yeah, he's he, seen it. Like he's he's, he's going he to, to but... he's going to see everything. Joel yeah. and I actually have other jobs, and well, granted, <laughs> Joel watches way more movies than I do. And I got other stuff going on, so I'm gonna get to everything. So I, I try my hardest for you guys, but uh, uh, yeah. So this is actually like the final episode, the final like um, you know normal episode before we get to the top ten. But before we wrap up, uh. There is no box office for this week's, obviously, because we're recording on a Friday. But we can let you guys know that, you know, from last week in Star Wars and Ferdinand, uh, the John Cena Bull movie uh, opened up last week. And, of course, Ferdinand crushed Star Wars. Um, <laughs> John Cena as a talking bull, just, you know, clean, clean shot. No, uh, Ferdinand actually did not do that well. It only opened up to, like, I think... 13 million and uh that's pretty bad for an animated movie especially especially that one who started its marketing campaign back in the spring i remember when the first yeah. trailer dropped and it said and it, christmas 2017 and i was like uh and also and it also somehow has a budget of 111 million dollars yeah, it's like it's like what the fuck? It's like you you hire John Cena and Peyton Manning for cheap labor, and yet your movie still costs like fucking exp- whatever. Uh, and then of course Star Wars uh, uh, came in at number one, obviously with two hundred and twenty million. It is twenty nine million less than The Force Awakens, but let's be real, folks. Nothing is ever going to even come close to The Force Awakens ever in history, just because that was such a a, a weird enigma, and people have been anticipating a new one and. Like, like there was a lot of special factors that played into that, uh, but this one with the 220 opening, that makes sense. It's Star Wars; it's gonna break the 200 mark easily. Um, it is interesting to kind of see the pace of it, though, because it, it, it has been a week since it uh, has come out, and so Box Office Mojo has The Force Awakens uh, its seven day total at 390. Uh, the last Jedi seven day total is at two ninety six. So that that's interesting. That's a hundred million dollars off. That just shows you how much of an an enigma the Force Awakens was. But uh, it's it's gonna break three hundred by uh, now. <laughs> it's probably already broke it. Uh, so by the weekend, it'll probably take a let's say a sixty percent drop, maybe fifty five. So it'll make another ninety five to a hundred. So it's gonna definitely be at $400 million domestically by the end of this weekend. And no telling for the Christmas break, uh, for Christmas Day and stuff and Christmas <laughs> Eve, like how much it's going to fucking make. So yeah, I have no I, I, I'm going to go. I'm probably going to go see it. And I still ha- you know, I get free tickets in my theater, but I'm still going to have to pay for it because they don't they don't allow passes until 17 days after it's released. Exactly. So I still so, have, I still have a sev- a several days before I can uh, I, I could be able. To- well, no, wait. Maybe the- no, yeah, yeah. So 17, yeah. So Joel, so Joel, will, Joel will contribute right. to the hundred million that's going to get again. Yeah. Uh, what, what, this weekend, <laughs> I have never seen this in my life. So get this: we have downsizing, father figures, Pitch Perfect three, I Tanya uh, expanded, Shape of Water expanded, Hostels is in three theaters, The Post is in nine theaters, Darkest Hours in eight hundred theaters. This weekend is one of the most the stacked greatest, weekends. The greatest I've... Shonen and uh, Jumanji are Wednesday releases, so they'll, yeah. they'll get a little boost from that. That's ridiculous. Like, stop it. Like, I've said this <laughs> multiple times, even when, before Joel was on this show, is that you're cannibalizing each other, Hollywood. Stop it. Like, it just – would you fucking spread this out? It's just – it's ridiculous. Whatever. Uh, so that is the uh, the weekend movies, and, of course, Joel gave you his thoughts on downsizing, so you can – you know, take for what you will on that and go see it if you want to. Um, it, Pitch Perfect 3, no thank you. And Father of the Figures, no thank you. So there you go. Uh, and, of course, Jumanji, uh, no thank you. Uh, Joel did not like it. Uh, oh, I don't like, really have yeah, the urge. It was awful. Yeah, awful. I don't have the urge to see it. And I'm going to tell you right now, Joel is a little higher on it than me. He's more kind of lukewarm with it. I did not like The Greatest Showman, so i yeah. got to be honest with you. Out of everything, it sounds like downsizing is the only new good one, I guess, according to Joel. So uh, good luck picking. <laughs> so that's all <laughs> we can really offer you. But, um, yeah, but that's pretty much the box office. really nothing uh, And more. also, oh, also uh, Christmas Day, you have um, all the money in the world, which people are probably going to be wanting to see because of the whole story around it. You know, they know about it. Trust me. And uh, people have heard about this thing already. And then uh, also Molly's Game will will is actually opening like two hundred and something theaters so that might uh, make some make some money with the uh, art house crowd, which you know 
kind of a pretty bad movie, but it'll it'll still uh, it'll still make money. It's Aaron Sorkin. It's Jessica Chastain. I feel like people are going to go see it uh, who are interested in that kind of stuff, and that'll be uh, a lot of people, relatively speaking. So that'll 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 likely uh, at least make the top fifteen. I think. Yeah, probably. And then uh, on December 29th, in a limited release, is a film that Joel and I have already seen, and it doesn't open up in D- in Dallas until the end of January, so we got to hold our reviews for it. But it's uh, film, s- film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool uh, yeah. with Annette Bening. Uh, we've already seen it, but that's limited. And uh, just to let you guys know, since this this is the last like normal episode, I'm going to just say it. My first movie of the new year is Insidious 4. And guess what? Unlike the Bye Bye Man, I'm actually excited to see this one. So you can make fun of me. I don't give a fuck what you want to do. I'm actually excited for the first uh, 2018 movie. So hey, there you hey, go. I mean, technically, technically, the first 2017 movie was um, Underworld Blood Wars, which I saw. I didn't see that, Joel. I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's I've, a reason I've why. Actually got, I've actually made this like uh, um, uh, packed with myself to see the first release of the year, whatever it is. And so I'm actually going to have to catch up with Insidious Chapter 3, which I never saw, in order to, to understand this one. Um, but, you know, I, I saw Leap Year and Daybreakers. I saw Season of the Witch. I saw The Devil Inside. I saw Texas Chainsaw. I saw Paranormal Activity, the marked ones, or whatever it was. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, I, I've seen all of the ones that that were the first one, and it's just like a ritual. I just I just like to go to the first wide release, and it usually backfires because I don't think I liked any of them. But uh, it's just something I do. So well, you, I, you, know, um, you know what, Joel? Uh, if you don't like it, then whatever, keep it to yourself. But uh, <laughs> you know what? I, listen, I, I've liked all the Insidious movies, and I do like a. Uh, uh, Lee Winnell uh, as a as a writer within the genre like the first three Saw movies are great the first three Insidious movies are great I'm hoping number four is great I really love Cooties uh, according to my quote on the back of it so I'm a huge fan of this guy and I really hope that um, he just continues to you know write these you know nice little creative horror films like they're not anything they're masterful or mind blowing, but I've always been entertained by all the movies that he's been a part of, whether uh, he has co written, uh, fully written, or directed. Like, I've always been behind it. So, that's the first film of the new year. Super stoked for that. But that's pretty much the end of the year wrap up. So, guess what, guys? December 31st, episode 211 is the annual top 10 of 2017 we are recording on friday actually of december 29th and i will release that episode uh probably around 8 a.m on december 31st to get super early because it'll probably be a nice juicy long one there you go that's what she said and uh, you'll have it for the rest of the day and you can listen to it whatever and we'll have a special guest on um and uh we'll reveal that obviously when we record and so yeah uh, just look forward to it on December 31st, I'm, and that's pretty much it. Uh, Joel, uh, do you have any last words uh, on our on our final normal episode of 2017? The best film of 2017 was The Bye Bye Man. Okay, no. Um, <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> okay, so uh, no, I don't. I'm, uh, guys, go see Star Wars if you, for some reason, haven't yet. Uh, enjoy it. And also see Shape of Water. Also see Call Me by Your Name. And also check out Downsizing if you so if you feel so inclined. Uh, if not, I guess rent it down the line um, from from something. And uh, yeah, a bunch of good movies this week. Yeah, I, I concur. There's a lot. L- listen, there might be a lot of garbage out there right now, but there are some nuggets of greatness. So just go search for them. You guys have heard all the reviews from Joel and myself throughout the year and the Oscar season. So please just. Make good choices in life. That's all we tell you. But uh, yeah, we want to thank you guys for you know another great year of listening. It isn't over yet. We got one more, but this is the last normal one before we get into the the big uh, one of the year, which is always my favorite one, uh, is the top ten list. But yeah, so this is episode two hundred and ten. So to wrap this up, Joel, where can the wonderful people find you online? You can find my writing at uh, uh, joelonfilm dot com. I've got a few reviews still in the works. Um, I've got. Molly's Game and um, All the Money in the World coming probably maybe the day after Christmas. I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, and then um, I've got Call Me By Your Name and Downsizing dropping tomorrow. So those haven't been finished yet, but I do have Greatest Showman. I do have Jumanji, Star Wars, uh, and more on, on, my, uh, on my front page. 
and then uh, also at Twitter, uh, uh, Real Joel Copeland. Yeah, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's uh, at Real Chase Lee, and then uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you can you know watch some other reviews that I've talked about, like the Greatest Showman. Uh, Molly's game is up there. Uh, I did a bunch of screener reviews that uh, were sent to us. So you know I caught up over the past two weeks, and I've just been kind of pumping them out. Um, I didn't formally review uh, three three billboards, but I will say I absolutely loved it. And it may or may not be in my top 10. And same goes with Shape of Water. So now you don't know which one I'm going to put on there. But I uh, absolutely love that one to death. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really see anything else. Yeah, that's about it. So, all right, guys. Uh, and, it, and, of course, for this episode, please like it, share it. You know, just tell your friends that it's an okay podcast to listen to uh while you're on the toilet uh, i don't care where you listen to it working out driving whatever but we just want to thank you guys you guys are the best you guys are badass um so please spread this around and let's let's make 2018 an even bigger year all the links will be in the description below in court, uh including the intro and outro music which is done by my friends band fervent rose check them out and speaking of that let's play it out see you guys for the end of the year show This has been real. 2018, here we come. Let's get to that top 10 list. Bye-bye. Bye.